Hey guys, welcome back. This is Christopher Whitmer speaking. I am here by myself. I'm going to try to make this quick, uh, but give you guys a little bit of an explanation of what is up and why I am finally releasing an episode after a nearly, well, over a year uh, hiatus from releasing any episodes. Um, long story short, the Third Way podcast... Um, was neglected due to time. I I just ran out of time and I had other priorities that I really felt like I was supposed to be prioritizing above this podcast as much fun as we had on the podcast. There were other things in my life that were taking higher priority. Um, so it just kind of got put on a back burner. But then as well, I kind of went through this journey of trying to figure out what I believe and what angle I wanted to take on the Third Way podcast. Um, so going forward, I actually, I'm really excited about the angle that we're taking. I have this deep question of, okay, so if, if there's this premise, this kind of this idea that a lot of us hold, and if you grew up in Anabaptist circles, you kind of hold this by default, even if you don't realize it. Um, and some people who identify as kingdom or as nonviolent kind of hold to this idea that participating in politics is wrong voting is wrong um and there's obviously there's a lot of discussion even in my circles of theology about this and um and i i kind of after the previous season that we did i kind of was was reevaluating that i was really wondering is it actually wrong to vote is it wrong to participate in politics I, I i still to this day don't completely have it set in stone what i believe about that and so i, I really started to question how i should approach the podcast um and how i should approach my personal life like i was kind of just trying to figure out what i believe and and i kind of came to this place where i, I was almost willing to vote um in this past election and i was i was really wrestling with that and um, since then, I've kind of reevaluated my reevaluations, and I think I'm 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 developing again a, just a vision and a conviction against participating in politics, against voting, and I think I'm willing to say that a lot with with, with gr greater boldness and, and confidence. But it leaves me this with this one underlying core question that if we're not going to vote in, and participate in politics, if we're not going to run for office or put forward legislation or whatever, how then do we do justice? What is the Christian Jesus-centered, nonviolent approach to justice? And um, and that's kind of the core question that I am wrestling with. And so I'm I'm going to be talking with a lot of people. We're gonna I, I want to go over again just why it's wrong to vote. Like we have that assumption. I kind of have that assumption, but I want to wrestle with that. Why? What's the reason behind that? Why do we say that it's wrong to vote? That it's wrong for Christians to participate in politics? So I'm going to be asking people about that question. I'm going to be asking them of, of how they participate in pursuing justice. And what what the alternative is to justice if you can't if you if Christians don't want to use the political regimes to bring about justice on earth, um, so w how are Jesus people supposed to do that? Because I really feel like if we're gonna tell each other and say, hey, don't vote, don't participate in politics, we don't want to force our will upon anybody, we don't want to bring violence against anybody. Um, then I think it's incumbent upon us to lead the way in finding ways to bring about justice, to find ways to help the poor, to stand up for the oppressed, to, um, you know, you name it, whatever issue is at the front or at, is, is close to our hearts. I think we should be leading the way in finding creative ways to to bring awareness and to bring solutions and, and actual meaningful change. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm curious in exploring, like, what does that look like? What does it look like for a Christian to pursue justice if they're not going to be pursued, if they're not going to be pursuing politics? Um, because I feel like it would be an injustice just to say no to voting, no to politics, and then I'm just going to sit at home and live my own simple, safe lifestyle. I think that truly would be uh, an incredibly privileged position to take, Um and so I, I think there has to be an alternative, and I think Christians should be leading the way. And so I'm I'm really interested in hearing 
people's perspective. I'm going to I'm going to have people like Matthew, my guest today. I'm going to have him on. Maybe I'll have him on again. I, I have a whole nother list of questions to ask him that I'm interested in hearing uh, from him about. I'm going to be talking to uh, a couple of friends of mine. I want to to get a couple friends who are involved in politics and uh, some of them are nonviolent, and so I'm, I'm curious what their perspective is on that. W- you know, where they come out on being nonviolent and yet also participating in politics. Um, I'm gonna have one friend on who is a politician. He's ran for office and held elected office. He's also a businessman. Um, so I'm interested in, in just hearing his perspective of that, hearing his experience. Um, I'm a big fan of long form podcasts. Uh, so it along with just enjoying like a deeper more meaningful conversation i also um just want this podcast to work practically in my life and if it's going to be something going forward it's got to be low maintenance maintenance so the less editing that i can do the easier it's going to be to push out um i think meaningful content and obviously there's a balance to that, but um, I really enjoyed this conversation that I had with Matthew and some of the others that I've had where it's just kind of relaxed and um, his kids interrupt him a few times, which I think is beautiful and wonderful. Um, and there's some noise going, a little bit of noise going on in the background in my house. And I, I just, I like that relaxed, comfortable, more natural conversation. And I think it leads to some interesting questions and some interesting dialogue and obviously I hope as I have more conversations I'll get better at it and it'll be even more engaging and meaningful and I'll think of even better questions to ask and I'll be able to push back a little bit play the devil's advocate whatever um so I'm really excited about this going forward um one question I do have is what you guys the listeners enjoy right now I am going to be releasing entire episodes and, and if you guys just want to listen in parts, you know, most podcast apps will save your progression through a podcast. So today's episode is three plus hours. Um, so if you want to listen to it all in one stint, you can do that. If you want to listen to it in part, you can pause it and come back to it. I'm not going to be offended. Um, but at the same time, if that's a deter to any of you guys, if that's frustrating or cumbersome, the other option that I have thought about is just releasing like one hour at a time or like roughly one conversation uh, topic at a time. Um, so I can split this one into three parts. If the next one is two hours, I could put, split that into two parts or wherever the topics kind of um, present themselves. Um, so if that's something that's preferable to you, I would love to hear your feedback. Um, you can email us. I'll have the email in the show notes, I don't actually have it in front of me. Um, I forget exa- what exactly. It's been too long. <laughs> I forget exactly what the email is. I think it's thirdway at thirdwaypodcast at gmail.com. I forget if there's a the in front of that. Um, but yeah, I'll have that in the show notes. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of some of the what you can expect from this podcast going forward. Obviously, I miss the boys. I miss Titus and Reagan and Asher. I love their brilliant feedback. Um, I love their dialogue. I love our banter. Um, but they all have their own podcasts. They have families that they're looking after and taking care of. So it's not super practical to schedule podcast uh, episode recordings around four different people's schedules, especially since it's a little bit, um, um, yeah, yeah. It's just it's just hard to do that. Um, so I'm hoping to have them on for one or two or three more episodes this season um we still need to figure all all of that out but um yeah this is this is roughly what you can expect going forward and i hope i hope yeah if i i I hope it's meaningful to you um it's it's gonna be a lot kind of driven by like my own personal questions and my own hang-ups and problems that i have with my own theology or with someone else's theology or whatever i'm going to be pressing in bringing people from all kinds of perspectives um so i hope that's beneficial to you guys as well if there's an angle or a, or a question that you guys have i would love to hear about it um but yeah this is bordering on a 10 minute intro 
not all of the episodes will have this long of an intro, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of an explanation of where this podcast is going and why it has taken so long to produce another podcast. So without further ado, welcome back to the Third Way Podcast. recorded anything in for a podcast in probably just about a year maybe over a year is that right kind of crazy yeah how come um i got busy i um i am like i I work for the revolution and do hard things community so um i felt a priority for them and i I felt like that was getting a little neglected um when Uh i was doing the podcast um so it just kind of went on a back burner for a while, but yeah, no, I this is I this is kind of a a creative outlet for me, um, and and kind of actually um, one of the things that I want to do with the episodes going forward is is, just, is explore things that I personally am trying to figure out, and um, hopefully in the meantime it can be of some service to people. So yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of, my plan is kind of to make this as low maintenance as possible, hopefully not too much editing. So, um, I'll probably have an introduction ahead of this and we'll just take the conversation from here. I'll have introduced you and everything. So, well, you're talking to Mr. No edit podcast. So awesome. Perfect. That's the way to do it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's why we live stream it. Then it's not even an option. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I've I've considered it. I'm not brave enough to do that quite yet. But <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm really excited about this. Yeah, you told me, you told me that you didn't have any time constraints. So um, just let me know if there's a moment where you need to get off. I know that you have a family and I'm sure other responsibilities. So, but I have a lot of questions, and so we'll just. Um, jump into it mostly revolving around politics obviously it's the third way podcast but i I also have a lot of other um stuff that i have been curious to ask you so um so we'll see Uh, maybe uh do we only know each other online right yeah yeah we do um were you gonna did you have a question no i was just trying to track track the connections yeah uh, I've been on I've been on Asher's podcast, mm-hmm. and I know of Asher for a long time for his writing. Sure. Um, and you, I guess, it's just a Facebook connection. Yeah, basically. So um, when we start, when we were first doing the Third Way podcast, um, well, I mean, this podcast a year ago, I was doing it with Titus and Reagan and right. Asher, and Titus kept talking about this Matthew Milioni fellow, and. And he's like, Christian anarchist, I, I don't, we're, I'm, I'm going to get to that. I don't know if you <laughs> embrace that label or not, but he kept talking about you as this Christian anarchist, which was intriguing. Uh-huh. Um, and sometime around, I don't remember the exact timeline, but I stumbled across the old um, Kingdom Fellowship support group. Oh, that's and, right. Yeah. And so I, I kind of started to enter the fray and I was like, okay, uh-huh. this is weird. It to me, like I hadn't, I, I've known about Berceau a little bit. Um, I've known like rumblings of kingdom people, but I, I didn't realize like there was a movement of kingdom people. And, I, and so I was really kind of confused. Like, where did all these people come from? Right. Like who, what are the, what are the roots? What are the, the, the foundings of these people? Um, and then I don't, I don't know, it was probably soon after that, that the Dank group was, came up and, and Titus was like, I think messaged me and was like, Hey, you should join this Dank meme King Christian <laughs> kingdom memes group. 
So I was like, okay, this is kind of strange, but sure, let's go go for it. And here are all these like adult Christian mature thinkers <laughs> making these memes. And there again, it was kind of confusing. I was like, okay, where's this coming from? And um, it kind of, I don't know, I'm sure you remember. I kind of, I kind of was took it. You really weren't a big seriously. fan originally. I wasn't a big fan. <laughs> it took me a little bit to get used to it. And I think um, I was projecting a lot of things onto people. I think I projected some things onto you and onto David Iker and probably some of these other people. And um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what triggered those things, but I just thought I knew who you guys were. And, and then I once, it was almost in the kind of, getting into the fray a little bit that I realized you guys are actually super chill. Yeah. That, that there's a cultural um, assimilation curve to the dank kingdom meme group. It's, it's not yes. um, you kind of, I almost think we should put people just on watch mode for yeah. <laughs> a good month or so before yeah. they start engaging. Cause till you know, kind of how lightly we all take ourselves right it can it can be misconstrued yeah yeah for sure yeah is that possible on facebook to just be like hey you can't engage i think you can put you can you can for sure put people on post approval in a group okay. especially private groups so sure. it would be possible i hate i hate all that though i don't like yeah. i don't like like we get people in that group every once in a while and i feel like they're always pushing the limits to try to get themselves kicked off and i never <laughs> like i never like being the guy that will bite that bait yeah. so <laughs> I don't know. I kind of, tr we kind of try to keep it as open as we can and still on track. It's sure. a, it's a dance. Well, I'm sure it would add just a whole nother level of maintenance for you guys to right. keep track of who's ready to come off the list. And... I'll tell you what though, let, uh, while we're on that subject, yeah. you know, that's that whole group has been like incredibly experimental and, yeah. and the premise behind it for, uh, I think, for Titus, for sure, he's been in on some of the conversations, and Anthony and I. Um, my my interest has been, I I've been an advocate for new media mm -hmm. for a long time, and I'm in I'm most ingratiated, at least in the past, with circles who are still trying to decide if they want to have the internet at all. Mm -hmm. And so my position among the people where I'm I've been most acquainted has been very counter and countercultural like people are deciding whether they can have smartphones or not and what mm -hmm. they're going to do with the internet and i'm like hey let's get on facebook and make memes so yeah. it it's been you know now here in boston it's not quite so much that way but where i'm coming from it is sure. and and as i've watched people you know the the ethos of us coming to boston for followers of the way to start here was that we wanted to be in the marketplace of ideas. We wanted to be in the center of things. We wanted to be having the hard conversations. And we saw the kingdom of God making a retreat to rural isolation. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to bring everything back to the center and say, no, mm -hmm. we have something to say here. We have a part to play in the polis. We want to be in yeah. the mix. And, yeah. and I think the, the, the take on social media and even using memes like as as counterintuitive slash blasphemous as some people think it is to have kingdom Christian memes, yeah. it's really been an experiment to see where how are we using communication and yeah. technology to 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 do what we're here to do to make the yeah. points that we're supposed to make. And yeah. to that end, you know, it's not that there haven't been missteps or some offenses or things gone wrong or crossed lines or any of all that's happened for sure. Um, but over, I'm overwhelmingly impressed with how much good has come out of that group, how many new conversations, what a sense of community people have been able to develop, real friendships outside of the online community. There's even, uh, there's even uh, a relationship that started from DKCM yeah. now. So it's so, cool. so this is neat stuff. I yeah. mean, it's just an experiment to see where it would go and it's, yeah. it, it's going really well. Yeah. Yeah, and I well, I think it. I think even just the sense of um, community and like, oh, I'm not, especially particularly in 2020. Like, what a year, right? That to happen. Like, it happened actually end of last year, right? But I mean, in perfect timing. Yeah, because because I think a lot of people. Well, I I can't even imagine because a lot of the people that I've, I feel like I've grown to trust the most have come through connections through 
um, that meme group, um, you know, just in processing COVID and processing right. how we respond to government and then all the election stuff and whatnot. Like, right. I, I would I would think a lot of us would probably feel a lot more isolated going through all of that without sure. a community of people that seem to seem to still have their feeding footing at least on the same wavelength yeah 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 so yeah that um yeah that's that's all really interesting stuff that hits some of some of what i wanted to ask you about um i might back up a little bit um sure i one question that i want to come back to is um why boston but i don't really want to address that right now um i want to back up a little further so I discovered who you were kind of through Titus. Obviously I'm Asher Whitmer's brother. Right. Um, and, um, and, and we lived in Los Angeles, California. I live in Philly now. Um, we're, we're very much kind of came up through the Mennonite ranks. I mean, in many ways I would still identify as Mennonite and still technically BMA. Um, you guys run Kasumu, right? Cons- what's that? Oh no, that's Titus that was in Africa. Yeah. That was yeah, in Kenya. Yeah. yeah you yeah. weren't in Kenya. No. Um Asher was in Thailand with his family for three years. Um, with Igo? Yeah. And I've I mean, I did the Igo thing. Um, I've traveled, I've been in a couple couple different continents just doing mission work, which is something I didn't put that in my notes, but if we get time to it, I'd love to hear your perspective of missions. But anyways, I, I have a lot, like I said. Um, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um no, but let, I would love to back up a little bit because, because like I said, like these kingdom people seemed from my kind of Mennonite perspective seemed to just spring up from every, from nowhere and everywhere. And, right. um, and I kind of every now and then I like to jab people and be like, well, you're just, you're actually kind of Mennonite, right. but, but I, I actually, I actually don't think that you're, it's very different. And I, and I realize kind of the differentiation um, but like where, where would, I would love to hear your perspective of where you came from and, and like, what's your story? How did you, like, obviously Milioni, you're not, you don't have any Mennonite background no. connections. Um, I think maybe you came through charity. Uh, am I, like what, yeah. What's your story? Sure. So I, I grew up in the fundamental independent Baptist churches. Okay. My my grandfather was kind of the old school, first school of, of that movement back in the 50s. He was a preacher, but an Italian immigrant as well. So okay. I, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of unique in that I have a bunch of Italian family, but it's we're not Catholics. We're all Baptists. Interesting. So I don't have the yeah. common Italian immigrant experience, sure. at least religiously. Um. So I grew up in fundamental independent Baptist churches and, and was, you know, my, my, my conversion happened kind of in spite of that upbringing. I, 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 I met my wife out on the streets. We, we were skinheads. We lived on the streets for quite a few years. And then when we got married, um, she had a, a, a radical conversion, uh, like a supernatural experience conversion and I would have been a presumptive Christian, like a cultural Christian since I was a boy. Like for me, what it meant to be a Christian was to believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for my sins and he rose again on the third day. Like if you said yes to that checkbox, you were a Christian. If you said no to that checkbox, you were a heathen. That's all the more it meant to me. And I, I never doubted those things. It was never like, like, it, they were just historical facts. I, I, I didn't know why anybody did doubt that. I guess it was just from not being in America. Cause like my Christianity was just like my Americanness. It was just an inherited identity. So mm-hmm. when my wife was converted, then um, that kind of threw things in a way different perspective because now I was watching somebody become a Christian de novo and I knew of some old people in the church that had been, I had heard like had been rough when they were young or whatever, but everybody I knew that was a Christian had always been a Christian Mm -hmm. my whole life. And so watching my wife develop nascent faith and, and change was a new experience for me. And it brought me to a place through, through her largely where I said, you know, whatever, whatever I figured out about Christianity like it hasn't done me any good. Like for all the good it's done, I might as well be a Buddhist, except for I had, I'd have been a way better person if I'd been a Buddhist. And so like, what good is that? 
there must be something more than what I've figured up, out up to this point. And I think a lot of that for me was about growing up in a church. Well, the doctrine was a big part of it, like that eternal security stuff and the, the just sign on the dotted line kind of transactional Christianity that's all about you going to heaven was a, a large part of it, but it was also comforting. Like I wanted to believe that. I wanted to believe, I, you know, there's one of the most pivotal moments I remember from my from my uh, youth was Eric and I had gotten in a street fight. It was just me and her with a whole gang. And there was several guns there. And it was the closest I was to being killed. I thought we were going to die. And she did too. And when we, when we made it out of there and were laying in bed that night, she said to me, so what would have happened if we would have died tonight? And I said, well, I would have gone to heaven and you would have gone to hell. And she's like, why? I said, because I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins and you don't. And she's like, that's dumb. I said, I know it's dumb. You should just say the prayer and believe Jesus died for your sins and you can go to heaven. Like that's how shallow yeah. and ineffectual what I had developed. Now, I don't, I can't put that all on the doctrine and upbringing that I was raised with, but it certainly made a lot of room for that. And the rest was what I wanted to believe. Of course, I want to believe I'm going to heaven when I die and that it doesn't have to affect me in any way. So that's why I think when Erica really had a, 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 an experience with God that changed her substantially, it was it was something that I marveled at. I was like, oh, that's new. That's not what I've known before. There must be something else here. And wrestling through that is what really, really brought me to a place where I was able to identify Christ as someone instead of something, instead of like a historical figure like like nero or any other historical figure that i believe existed he became someone i could know and someone i could involve myself with and somebody i could be participatory with so that's where we started from and i, I went back to the baptist church at first when we were this was just after we got married and and god was very patient and faithful with me he he because i I, w I was raised Baptist, and there's a lot of that easy believism, especially the earlier version of that that isn't quite so so gross. Just the just repeat after me and believe this prayer with your whole heart and ask Jesus into your heart kind of stuff. That that version of Christianity was 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 pervasive to me, and when I but I but I I really like was. I was a pretty seriously religiously minded child. Like I, I liked the Bible. I understood it well and I learned it well. And I, I spent a lot of time involving myself in the scriptures. They were genuine, genuinely interesting to me. And so I knew the scriptures well by the time I was older. And, and it was that it was God shaking up my, my views of scripture and, and showing me new things that I had never seen or never thought of in the scriptures themselves that radicalized me. And I had this view from Sunday school when I was a little boy. I was, I don't know, I was a little boy. And I remember raising my hand in Sunday school and saying, what does it mean to be a fundamental independent Baptist? And, and Rick Cadman, family friend, my Sunday school teacher said, he thought about it for a second. He said, whatever the Bible says, we believe it. And that makes us fundamental independent Baptists. I was like, okay, well, that's a pretty good answer. Sweet. Yeah. But now I'm 20 and I'm converted and I'm reading the Bible with new eyes, like with a new form of sincerity. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we don't believe this and we don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And we don't believe this. And we don't, and what about this? And where is this? I've never seen mm -hmm. this before. And that process, I call it my radicalization. And Eric and I went through that mm -hmm. together, but she went through it as a blank slate. So it was mm -hmm. way, way easier for her. Mm -hmm. After, after a, a few years, um, I happened across, uh, so I, I met some like street preacher, Baptist radical friends. And we used to go street preaching at the university of Oregon and, you know, making a ruckus and doing that kind of stuff that you're supposed to do when you're young and zealous and, mm -hmm. And I don't say that dismissively at all. I actually sure. think that's a really good thing to do when you're young and zealous. Mm -hmm. um, and and he knew Mennonites, I think, from from Gothard conventions, from Bill Gothard right. conventions. And and we had heard that there were Mennonites in our area. And so we started looking them up because we had kind of worked ourselves out of the Baptist world. We didn't fit sure. there anymore. 
but I was still like, I still was eternal security and a bunch of other things I was confused about. And so I met the Mennonites and, you know, so the meetings, uh, the meetings were dry as cracker juice, as my Southern <laughs> friends say. Yeah. I, I could barely stay awake through it, especially as a Baptist. Like if sure. the preachers don't shout and if the people don't shout back, then nobody really means being at church. <laughs> so it was really hard for me to sit through those meetings. Yeah. But what, what kept me coming back was two things. The music was sensational. Mm -hmm. Like I'd never heard anything like that before. But it was also one of my biggest, one of the things that was the most disappointing to me as an early Christian was the lack of camaraderie and community because I was coming from a gang mm -hmm. where we, when we ah. call, I, I called my skinhead friend's brother yeah. and I meant it. I meant like, I will die for you. Like, and not academically, like in real right. practical, tangible ways, we put our lives on at risk for each other. And then mm -hmm. I came to the church and it was brother Bob and brother John and brother Bill, but I didn't know those guys from Adam. I'd never been in their house. I didn't know anything about them. I just knew whether or not they said amen and how loud on Sunday morning, but that was all the brother that I knew of them. And that was extremely dissatisfying for me. Mm -hmm. And the Mennonite people, when we first met them were the first people that I ever met who were actually living like a, like a faith community where they knew each other, their children were around each other, they were in each other's homes, they met each other's needs socially and physically and emotionally. Now, granted, a lot of them are actually literally family, but nonetheless, right. <laughs> it, was a, it was a picture that, what, that validated what my intuition was. Like, we can live in the church as a family. We can really sure. be a part of one another. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time there in Western fellowship churches, but not long. I knew it wasn't going to be a long-term solution, but it was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned a lot from those guys. Um, a few men in particular were, were incredibly bright spots in my past and still friends to this day. But I, I knew that that I, well, so we were still pre street preaching and I used to go out with a couple of my buddies and we go street preaching. And I remember one night coming back to get our wives and our little children and uh, I, we were doing kind of a roundup, like, how did it go? And I was like, you know what, guys, my biggest fear is that somebody's actually going to listen to us one of these times, because what are we going to do then? Yeah. Like, where are we going to send them? There's no way we're sending them back to the Baptists and the yeah. Mennonites can barely handle us. And we showed up pretty clean when we <laughs> got there. So that's not going to work. Like, yeah. what are we going to do? And that's when we really began struggling with what we should do. We started having our own little gospel meetings and people started coming, like we'd go round up all the dope heads in the town that we knew and we'd feed them lunch and we'd preach gospel meetings to them and stuff started happening. Like God started answering our prayers and a few people got converted and I was 20, 21, 22 years old. And it was just three young 20 somethings that didn't know where else to go. We'd go, we'd go have meeting with the Mennonites in the morning and then we'd have our own gospel meetings in the afternoon and it's stuff started happening. And wow. at, throughout that time, we were listening to a lot of charity tapes, a lot of charity tapes. We were, we were trading them like 10 year olds with baseball cards. <laughs> cause, cause we, we went to the Mennonite church for like a, for a, a, a social gathering. Mm -hmm. We listened to charity tapes for like some preaching meat. And then we had our own meetings for our ministry. Like everything sure. was in a different basket. Sure. And and we finally decided we would just commit to doing the thing that, that it seemed like God was working with us at. And that's how we started our first church. That ended up coming under, um, under loosely, you know, as loosely as you can use the word charity churches okay. eventually. But in, in the beginning of, of those days, it was just, it was just us being alive in God wow. and trying to make something happen. And I think that's, that's the ethos See, kingdom isn't supposed to be a, it's supposed to be an adjective, not a noun. It, it, it's supposed to be a descriptive term. And, and I think it's original and, and most people credit it to David's book, The Kingdom That Turned the World Upside Down. It's where a lot of us really grabbed a hold onto the term, mm -hmm. but it was in use before, obviously it's in the Bible, but it was right. you, being used colloquially before then and after then. I think that helped galvanize it. But what the sense of it f for me always was, there's something unique about the idea and the ethos that Jesus is a real and present king. Mm -hmm. And that the adjective of people that accept mm -hmm. that premise about mm -hmm. the gospel 
is kingdom people. Mm-hmm. And, and I meet a lot of Anabaptist people from time to time that aren't really up on that notion, yeah. non-resistance notwithstanding, the idea that Jesus is a now and present king of his people, a nation yeah. in the world yeah. today, and it should be operating as such, isn't a granted position even among conservative Anabaptists all the time. They're more sympathetic usually to it, and there are quite a few that do, but not everybody does. And I, I think that's what's really mm-hmm. what we've been trying to capitalize on for some time with the notions of kingdom and using it mm-hmm. is that. Now, the unfortunate thing is that the degradation of language is such that now it's becoming a noun. Like, are you a kingdom person? Like it sure. means a specific category. Like, do you sure. wear a head covering or go to this church or wear these clothes or all those things are being like imported into that terminology, but in its purer form and the way I think a lot of us still use it, it just means, do you recognize that Jesus is a real and present King of his people? Cause yeah. that says a lot. I really yeah. think that is the gospel. Yeah. Like that is the definition of what the gospel is. It's not, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and you can go to heaven. It's God sent Messiah to establish his nation on earth and he's come. Mm -hmm. That's the gospel. So, you know, that has a lot that, that granting that one fact makes a lot of pragmatic difference in a person's life. Yeah. I wonder if I'm, I'm just kind of getting started in um, Scott McKnight's book, the the, uh, King Jesus gospel. Yep. Um, which I'm sure, I don't, I don't, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, I'm familiar with it. I haven't read it, although I was just going through a study with a couple of guys who had just read it. So we okay. talked quite a bit about yeah. it. He, he differentiates between, and I'm sure his book is just like the, the surface of, of the King Jesus gospel, but um, he differentiates between a salvation cu- culture and a gospel culture. And he says, right. well, what many of us have grown up, even in Anabaptist circles, um, what, what many of us have grown up, calling the gospel is actually like a, a salvation culture where, right. where it's all about just getting saved and what, what, what can I do and still be saved and all that, those little, that right. little use. Well, it's super practical because if I tell somebody, if my gospel message is Jesus Christ died on the cross recent, God loves you, but you have a sin problem and Jesus Christ died on the cross to take care of your sin problem so that you can go to heaven. That's how much God loves you. Mm-hmm. People are like, yeah, sweet, man. I'm down for that. And I'm super grateful. Jesus is rad. Let's let's do this thing. Where do yeah. I sign up? Yeah. But then you go back to those people later and you say, okay, so Jesus said, whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And Jesus said that, you know, what whatever the hard sayings of Jesus are, Jesus yeah. said, love your enemies. And those people oftentimes, the, the ask Jesus into your heart people, they hear that and they're like, mm, I don't know if I want to do that one. Like, I think I'll, I think I'll think about it or maybe pass. But if the introduction to the gospel is God's establishing a nation on earth and he sent a King Jesus Mm -hmm. to establish his domain and reign and eventually to overtake the whole entire earth, it's going Mm -hmm. to be his again, because Mm -hmm. it was his to begin with. Mm -hmm. He's reestablishing his domain and rule over all of men over all of creation when you tell those and people are like wow that's in, that's intense yeah i want in i want yeah. i want to i want to be a disciple of that now you tell that guy okay the king said whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery the king said love your enemies then you're already disposed to say well he's the king like we of uh, i'm in his mm-hmm. nation we have to do what the king says it's sure. an entirely different yeah. way to approach yeah. what what jesus is doing in his teachings yeah, yeah. so th- that's a great springboard into politics because like would you say like that's kind of the underpinning theological framework for how you approach politics Yes, absolutely. Now we give that different terms. Like a lot of times we call it two kingdoms and, and there's, uh, and you know, that's a defensible term. I I, I appreciate the term two kingdoms, Mm -hmm. but two kingdoms derives from kingdom. Like Jesus has to be a king to even begin to talk about two kingdoms. Two kingdoms is a more abstract concept that there are only two powers in the world. Mm -hmm. There's this kingdom that Jesus is establishing and everything else. And I, 
<clears throat> it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a separate conversation, but it's like the first practical outworking of Jesus being the king. Because then you start, once you, once you move from Jesus's kingship to two kingdoms, now we start to talk about where do our allegiances lie and how do we interact? Because Jesus's kingdom obviously isn't a, a geopolitical state. It, it doesn't have it doesn't have a flag or a, a, a parliament or you know it's the, it's not marked out on a map. Right. It's something else, and that something else that it is 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 intangible. And so, how does that intangible kingdom that's existing now r- interact with the existing powers that are? And what's the authority? And where do those existing powers that are come from? Mm-hmm. That's that's where we start to that's where we have to start wrestling with well sure. where what is allegiance and how does that concept work sure. what is authority and how does that concept work all these other outworkings so i start with kingdom and then i recognize two kingdoms and then we talk about how to how to how to live in in between those spheres so how what how what, what would be your answer how would you answer people who um who can get behind like like i feel like a lot of maybe reformed people are kind of getting to this place where they're like yes jesus is a king right. um and and he has and even like, he wants to take over the earth right he wants to take over the earth and so right. then we're gonna do that by like dominion to, yeah by by taking over politics or by influencing right. politics you know getting christians into places of influence you right. know, it, it sounds very similar but i think they're two different ideas or even using you know you know you're you're using memes you know you're 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 taking something to to spread the message of the kingdom or whatever right like it it, how would you differentiate between what you believe and maybe what they're saying yeah so so it comes down to, for me, it comes down to the law of the king. Like, how, how did he tell us to, to exercise his authority on the earth? And, and, and there's, some, there's some really uncomfortable things he says about that. Uh, funny story. Yeah. When we were young Christians, very young Christians, uh, my car broke down in, in Chicago. I was moving from Michigan back to Oregon. And it was just Eric and I, my baby was with my mother-in-law, my very young baby was with my mother-in-law. And we were just going to drive for two days across the country. And, and we broke down in Chicago and I, I broke down on the freeway and my trailer broke and, and I dot truck pulled over and picked up my trailer and pulled us up to the next off ramp. And we got off there. It was, it was dark. It was an industrial area. And, um, the, the tow truck driver was a black guy. And I looked around the neighborhood and, uh, and this car, the streets were filling up and people were starting to drag race down the street. And we were the only white people there. And I said, Hey man, are we going to be okay here? He's like, Oh yeah, you'll be fine. And then he looked around in the windows. He said, no, you got to get out of here. And so, and so we, we had to go find somewhere else to stay. All this stuff happened. Like it was a really intense neighborhood where we were broken down. I had to go into a Western union and get 600 bucks cash and there's a prostitute in the corner and drug deals happening right next to me outside. And I'm like, Oh man, this is not a good situation. So I'm, I'm like, I told uh, Eric and I were talking about this. We're trying to figure out how to get out of here and how to get on our way. And, um, and she's like, she's, she's trying to be faithful. And she's like, well, we're, we'll be okay. I mean, God will protect us. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not going to send us like sheep among wolves. And I was like, uh, Actually, yeah. actually, there's a Bible verse. I know she didn't know the Bible. I was like, actually, it's kind of the other way around. Yeah, those kind of experiences with like super practical words yeah. that Jesus says, yeah. like they really run counter narrative. Like yeah. we don't want to, we don't want to be sheep among wolves. We don't want to bear crosses. We don't want to love enemies. Like these things still cut against the natural grain, and they have to be incorporated into what it means to be God's people on earth because. We see it in Jesus, right? We see it in his cross. We Mm -hmm. see it in his teaching. We see it in his compassion. We see it in the way that he works in his world. And he wants us to be the same people. He wants Mm -hmm. us to be his body. That means we should Mm -hmm. be reproducing what he was doing in the world. And that lamb among wolves, that, that meekness, that suffering, 
kindness, that that choice to to suffer for love rather than to ever produce harm mm. is what's upsetting the world. Like mm-hmm. a lot of this is tied into you can't have a real conversation about kingdoms without having a conversation about violence and coercion mm-hmm. and authority. They're they're yeah. in the concept yeah. of kingdom. Yeah. And so so when we look at what what I like to how I like to think about it is this turn the uh, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is not an innovation of Moses like retributive justice is a human thing like every culture in every place that I know of practices retributive justice what may be novel about Moses's prohibition is is the limit on retributive justice that you only get to take one eye for one eye because the propensity is if you take my eye, I'm going to take both of yours. Mm -hmm. If you take one of my teeth, I'm going to take three of yours. And, and what, what's novel about Moses is to prescribe limits on that Mm -hmm. to say, if you take a tooth, you only take a tooth and that there's some kind of like boundary set around it. But I feel like Jesus is coming as the new man, the new Adam, the new king. Mm-hmm. And he's saying to us, like, you've done the eye for an eye thing. Like, everybody gets that. Everybody knows how to do eye for eye. But what less evil does it make in the world? It doesn't yeah. make any less evil in the yeah. world. In fact, it only makes more. It just yeah. makes a bunch of people without eyes yeah. or without <laughs> teeth. Or right. that's all it can do. It can only it can only try to put a cap on top of the the violent expressions of the human experience. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that Jesus wants to cap it. I think what the new kingdom of Jesus is instituting is not just a new political order. I think it's a new human society. Mm -hmm. It's the people of Jesus as his body, what he intended human society to look like. John D says it all the time. The church is, the church ought to be what the world would be like if everyone obeyed Jesus. That's profound. Like yeah. we're supposed to be modeling together what God's intention for human social structures look like. And those human social structures as God intends them don't include violence and don't yeah. include coercion. It's not that we can't, it's that we won't. It's because we recognize that as the fallen backwards way. It's regressive and anywhere mm-hmm. where coercion is being employed, grace is not like it's it. Ha- what Jesus wants to do in the world has to engage the will and the heart and the whole man. Mm-hmm. And it's, he's not just controlling and suppressing evil. He's converting it and making it something new mm-hmm. and to enlist in his kingdom and to become a part of what he's doing in the world means to renounce those old means of repression mm-hmm. and coercion and control, like stamp it down. And that's what I hear from my reformed friends all the time is like, we got to control it. We got to stop it. We got to, mm-hmm. we got to crush the liberal agenda. We got to, we got to make the evil go away. And they're just putting it under a lid and maybe they can do that really well, but Mm -hmm. it's still under there. It hasn't gone anywhere, but Jesus is taking me an evil man and making me something different. And he didn't do that by force. And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it by force either. That's Mm -hmm. what's the difference. Like we are supposed to overcome the world. We're all, we are supposed to, we're supposed to radically make a different world in our wake. But mm-hmm. it's not through those old means. And, mm-hmm. and that has to enter into the discussion of what it means to occupy and to be, to be uh, an effective tool in, in causing the kingdom of God to grow in the earth. Yeah. Wow. It's, I mean, <clears throat> so a couple of angles I could take at this. Um, wh- yeah. Okay. So we're kind of operating under the assumption that coercion and and violence is is evil um right and and i mean i think i think most most of my friends mo- even a lot of my reformed friends would agree that generally like un uh justifiable justifiable violence is is wrong you know but how would you establish or like where how did you come to the place that that coercion and um kind of that controlling method is wrong like that god does not participate in that 
method. Well, I think, it, it, let me help your point a little bit more, sure. Sure. especially given, especially given the eschaton, the end of right. how all this comes, like if there's a return to some kind right. of like a dominant rule of Christ in the end, how do we sanction like this parenthetical Old Testament violence and eschaton violence? Where where are we at in the middle, and how do we justify that that expression? Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a there's some important places to look for that. One is that there's something special about this age. This dispensation is a is an appropriate term if you don't mix it up with dispensationalism. But this right. time is important because and it's distinguished especially by paul and romans this is a time for grace this is the time under the cross this is the time for reconciliation this is the time where god's people are calling people in we're we're using our own crosses our own blood sweat and tears our own sacrifices just like he did to usher mm -hmm. in people waves of people into the gospel of jesus christ and bring them into the kingdom of god to pluck them out of the domain of satan and put them under the domain of christ mm -hmm. and we have to purchase that with our own blood sweat and tears just mm -hmm. like he did it, it doesn't require anything less we if we're going to engage in his work we're going to have to pay his kinds of prices mm -hmm. if we want wow, to be faith yeah. if we want to be fruitful yeah and so so when i look at the model of jesus like if if jesus if Jesus had come with a sword in both hands, whacking at anybody that got in his way during his living ministry and said, you love your enemies, I still am obligated to love my enemies. Like that doesn't, he, he, I don't get to be on the same plane as him. Like sure. he creates life. And as the creator, he stands in a completely different place than me. I stand under the commands of my king. And I, I, he doesn't have to obey them. I do. They're not for him. They're for me. Now, I don't, I think you can create a, a, you can create a way of understanding this. That's not hypocritical for Jesus either, but, but needless to say, if Jesus tells me to love my enemies, I'm to love my enemies mm. for what, for whatever time I'm under his teaching and domain, it's my calling to love my enemies. And I don't believe that you can exercise much to the reformers consternation. I don't believe that you can exercise violence and love in the same, at the same time to the same person. You can't love and kill. You can't love and injure. You can't love and force. They're, they're mutually exclusive terms where, where I think that a lot of confusion comes in is when people are looking at Matthew five in contradiction with Romans 13 and how do we rationale how what rationale do we use to square the sword being given by god the ordained powers that they bear not the sword in vain with love your enemies and what how do we how do we meet in the middle of those things what do they both mean and that's a conversation in its own right mm -hmm. um it's worth it's worth looking at romans 13 and saying okay well what actually is being said here there's a way uh, how i like to explain uh comes from this principle comes from Leonard Bird when I talk about him all the time uh, anatomy of a hybrid it's a fantastic book everybody should read it okay. he he uses terms called conserving and redeeming grace he says there's he says basically and they're not his terms he got them from some academic article but what he says is god has two main mechanisms that he's using to reconcile men to himself one is this principle called conserving grace and the other is redeeming grace conserving grace is this romans 13 power and that power and this this will this will factor in quite a bit to whatever i would say about anarchy mm -hmm. this power that is is designed for a purpose that purpose is to keep men from descending into animals from becoming warlords and feudal states mm -hmm. like like if you look at okay i have a, i just talked to a friend from sudan he was talking to me the other day and and I, he's in uganda right now and he was I was asking him how things are going because I haven't followed it really closely lately since I, I haven't been working there. And and I asked him what was happening in Sudan. And he said, I asked him if there was peace. And he said, well, the government's not fighting anymore, but there's just there's just little militias all over the place. It's just little bush armies everywhere throughout the country. And and that kind of that 
kind of destructive anarchy where everyone's just it's just a it's just a power vacuum it's just yeah. who's going to accumulate enough force to exist and to control a big enough environment that they can they can live and pursue their means that that kind of environment is what god's trying to prevent by establishing ordaining authority so sure so the so so the 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 western notion of of state and and civil structure is that you and i uh you and i kind of like think back to abraham and his mm -hmm. herdsmen fighting with lots like the these two conflicting parties recognize that they're going to destroy each other and become a, a warring state and it's a it's a it's a zero sum game somebody's going to lose it all mm -hmm. so in order to in order to to continue to exist they they recognize this outcome and they say rather than us just war with each other until the last man stands let's defer our violence to some external party so we'll bring in a third party who will judge between us and we'll both agree to abide by that decision and we can have less violence and more prosperity and the social outworking of that order is what eventually leads to a civil structure called the state mm -hmm. I'm skeptical of that notion. I think that it's more likely that 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 two guys look down the hill at their neighbor and say we could kill him if we went together. And that's probably more likely the origin of state. But that's another matter. The fact is, order when it comes under civil structures does the same thing, whether it's a good order or a bad order. What I mean by that is that what God's after in Romans 13 happens in Pharaoh's Egypt, in Hitler's Germany, in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, in Nero's Rome. There's something essential about civil structure that exists in all civil structures. Even today in North Korea, you can't steal from the market. You can't kill indiscriminately. You can't do whatever you want. There's a power outside of you that forces some conformity to basic ethics of behavior and that's mm -hmm. how god is preserving order through the state he does that through the coercion of the sword because unregenerate man are subject to their passions and so they'll the the weaker of them morally will become the stronger of them physically and it descends into disorder so in order to prevent that god establishes order that what it with that view you can see just you can see nero as easily as Trump or Biden as God's ordained authority. They, they're serving, they're all serving the same function. They all do what God is trying to do through state. And it also allows you a view where you can say, England was the authority of the colonies until America, and then America was the authority of the colonies. It's a transitional yeah. authority. Whoever is holding the sword is the power and is sure. doing what God ordained that power to do. It's a much more fluid and, and, and all-encompassing view of state. And I think that's actually what Paul's advocating. We notice also that he's he's talking in terms of of pronouns that are them, not us, sure. throughout that yeah. whole discourse. Now mm -hmm. we go back to Romans. Now we go back to Matthew five, mm -hmm. and we look at what he said. What Jesus is saying is not an us them thing. It's a we. It's a you. It's a, I want you to do this, and mm -hmm. it's I want you to love your enemies. You've heard it been said by them of old times, I shall love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hatefully and despitefully use you and persecute you. Mm -hmm. That you may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise in the evil and the good. There, he's, he's giving a command and he's showing how it applies. It applies like the rain and like the sun. It's mm. everywhere. It's everywhere under God's benevolence is, is enacting this principle. Mm -hmm. And that's how God's people are. Wherever we are, we're enacting the benevolence of God. We're not doing the coercive thing. The, the nice thing about Verduin's construct, his way of understanding these concepts in the Bible, is that they're mutually exclusive. So wherever one begins, the other ends. Wherever you start to employ coercion, you have ceased to employ redemption. The redeeming uh. authority of the church is supposed to, like, like the conserving power creates a fabric mm -hmm. of society, right? It holds mm -hmm. humans together into some structure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the church is underneath that fabric. They're persecuted and mm -hmm. they're suppressed and they're, they're, they have problems with the order. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's another group. Sometimes it's nobody. Sometimes everybody's walking around on the fabric of society and it's good. 
in any case, the job of the church is to grab people out of that domain and out of that dominion and pull them into Jesus's domain, a new allegiance, a new order, a new king, a new society, a new people. That's very Hebrews 11, right? Like mm -hmm. a builder, a city whose builder and maker is God. Mm -hmm. They're not remembering where they came out from or they could have gone back, but they're pressing forward. They're looking for this place that's God's place, the mm -hmm. city of God. And, and, and that's what we're making. That's what we're being. That's how we're living. And so we're pulling people out of that structure into his. Well, we can't pick up the sword or we cease to be his. We're not doing what that order is supposed to do whenever we're employing coercion because Jesus can't get us there through coercion. If he could have, he could have just whipped us all into the gospel. He doesn't. He could have for yeah. if there was some way to force man's will into the gospel and still be a gospel, he would yeah. have done he could have done so, but he doesn't. He wants affection, he wants relation, yeah. he wants devotion, he wants us, not he doesn't want us to conform, he wants us to be with him. And that's an entirely different purpose and you can't force that any more than you can force Mm -hmm. your wife to love you or your children to love you or your neighbor to love you. You can't force people it, wherever you have forced people to love you. You are not, they're not loving you. It's, it's that kind of mutual exclusion. So, so would you say like the, the, cons the conserving grace or the, the state is kind of God's placeholder while, while he builds the kingdom? Yes. Is that kind of, and we need that order. Like I need the, so, the, so, so if we talk about political terminology, mm -hmm. I'm a Christo anarchist. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't believe that anarchy is the solution for the world. I don't think the world should be anarchistic. I think that voluntarism and non-coercive mm -hmm. mechanisms are how Christians should order their world. I should, as a Christian subject to Christ, I should never employ coercive structures or means to force my will in the world. This has a lot to do with my rationale for not voting. Uh, but, sure. but that principle of anarchy is, is really Christarchy. It's rule of Christ. Mm -hmm. And as subject to Christ, I don't participate in those other orders because they're based on coercion. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I need that order to exist. I think that God in his wisdom knew that if, if there wasn't for that structure, like, what kind of gospel work could I do in South Sudan? I could walk up there and get killed. That's what I could do. I mean, failing some kind of miraculous intervention, I could walk into South Sudan and be shot mm -hmm. or ransomed, you know, something like that, kidnapped and ransomed. There's, there's not a platform from which I can work for the gospel. There's not even a platform from which the South Sudanese church can work for the gospel because it's such a violent, lawless, chaotic place that there's nothing anyone can do but try to exist. Like survival is all that's happening. The, the neat thing about this order, that, that Romans 13 order, is that it's self-correcting. What I mean by that is that, like capitalism, I think capitalism has produced the things that it has produced because it uses as, its, as the fuel of its engine the, the vice of men. So the capitalist economy uses greed as its central premise. Its central ethic is greed, bottom line, profitability. Like that's all that matters in the market. And so all of our, all of our market and corporations are structured around these bottom line principles of what makes profit for the shareholders. Mm -hmm. That greed of man to want to acquire and want to conquer is the engine that drives the machinery. Well, mm -hmm. that engine, that, that fuel is never going to run out. We got more greed than we'll ever have oil. You're never going to run out of that. So mm -hmm. it keeps that machinery moving forward. It keeps it chugging forward. So the markets keep churning and com consumerism keeps being, you know, production keeps happening, cons consuming keeps happening. It just is a ever revolving mm -hmm. system. The same is true with the principles of civil authority. The, the point of civil authority, whoever's holding the sword, right? Whoever, mm -hmm. wherever the buck stops. And I don't care if that's a, that's a parliament or a president or mm -hmm. an oligarch or a king, wherever, whoever's holding the sword, they're incentivized like they're not they're not producers they're not making anything their incentive is to live as well as they can off of the the people and and the better they want to live they know by exercising authority that if they want to live well they need an orderly society they need an orderly market that they can tax they need an orderly populace that will continue to produce 
these are self correcting narratives. So as the state stabilizes the social order, it has all the incentive structure designed within state to produce as much stability as possible. And so it's always self-writing, it's always self-correcting. And anytime there's a destabilization, like civil war or whatever the case may be, everything teeters and comes out of balance and then it writes itself again. And then someone will take authority and someone will establish rule and someone will establish order so that they can continue to live off of tax, mm -hmm. the, the, the conscribed, the conscription of labor. I'm gonna mm -hmm. take my piece because you live in my order. Yeah, And that's, it has the same kind of self-correcting attitude so that, so that wherever we go, we'll continue to see the same thing. God sets these things, or I don't know, I don't know to what degree, I don't know how much God's playing chess. I don't know, mm -hmm. this gets into some other stuff because I'm an open theist, but I, I don't know how mm -hmm. much in particular, he's, he's involving himself in the affairs of state, especially as it pertains to the devil's power and authority in the earth. And the, the interaction mm -hmm. between those two spheres is a whole nother level to this that's above the physical. Um, and, and so I don't know how much like, I don't know to what extent the devil and God are moving chess pieces mm -hmm. on the geopolitical chessboard. Mm -hmm. To some degree, for sure they are. And, and, and for sure, in the supernatural world, in, in the realm of powers and principalities, there's, there's things happening and, 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 and supernatural order changing and conflict happening and disruptions happening. I believe all that. But wherever it is, wherever men are organized, wherever men have incentive to be in the same place, they're going to keep reproducing these orders because it's something built into men that mm -hmm. that that original institution is a human institution to want to have this order and to want to create a, a civil society. So would, would you then as a, so, so you, you recognize the kind of the need or maybe the temporary need, the placeholding of the state and how right. that benefits you um, as, as someone who would like to, preach the gospel and not get killed, you know, um, or, um, I mean, it benefits all of us, um, not just you, but, um, mm -hmm. what, um, what, so, oh, I kind of forget where I was going to go with that one, one angle, so, you know, like my Baptist friends, um, you know, m the majority of Christian Christendom in America would say, would see preserving that order, even though maybe it's not our primary domain as Christians, like preserving that order is for our benefit, because look at all the good we've done. Like, right. look at all the peace and in and, and the way that America has been able to send out missionaries, which right. we could talk about how the net benefit uh, of that. Um, you know, the, the charity work we've done, all the money we've sent and food and whatever. Um, so then they would say there is some nobility, there is some goodness in helping to preserve America. Like we as American Christians, there's value in us keeping America around. Um, so, so like what, what is your approach to America as you, as you watch as, you know, like, is, is that, is that just like, that's not your domain. So while it's here, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to go out on the street and preach unashamedly and right. I'm not going to have to strategize and how to evangelize to my neighbor undercover because I don't have to do that. And I'm going to enjoy it while it lasts. I don't care if it falls apart. It like, like, how or, do we, yeah. Like, how do you handle that? What would you say to your Baptist friend who, who had, you know, yeah, I, I, I have had that conversation quite a few times. Yeah. Um, let me let me let me restate the question. Sure. How, how do we. Um, what's the value of if there's a value in an orderly state mm -hmm. are what obligation do we have to help preserve the maintenance of that order? Yeah. Yeah. 
um, I, 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 depending on who I'm talking to, there's, there's, there's quite a few different approaches to that answer. I don't have as optimistic a view of America's history or record in the world. I have a much more um, Zin Chomsky view of American history. Uh, I think that the, uh, let me, let me back up before we even get there. One of, one of the things that's most interesting to me as an amateur student of history, mm -hmm. very amateur student of history is, is the environment in which the church is born. I'm fascinated with the first through the third century of the Roman empire of the known world. And what's interesting to me as an American is all these correlations between the Rome of the early centuries uh, AD and America, the epoch that she's been in for the 20th century, since the 20th century. And, and, <laughs> you can read orators from Rome and just exchange Rome with America and they work just as well. Like yeah. the things that people are saying about Rome in the first, second, first, second century are exactly what people are saying about America today. She's ennobling the world's poor. She's raising up all of all of the weak and downtrodden out of their misery and making them bold and prosperous and brave. She's preserving and maintaining order in the world. She's the goodness of God on the earth. Like all this manifest destiny stuff has yeah, its origin yeah. back in the Roman Empire. And what's well, interesting to me. I mean, there, there's a reason that, you know, even architecturally America emulated right. Rome, you know? Right. And what's interesting to me is to see how, how the Christians in those same centuries are interacting with state power. Mm -hmm. um, having come from an apostle who's beheaded, like how are the, how are the Gentile Christians engaging in in the climate of mm -hmm. of rome who sees herself as the savior of the world mm -hmm. and 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 the embetterment of humanity comes through the power and dominion of the empire and i think what's interesting is that the 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 christians seem to hold this like they teeter on these two between these two extremes on the one hand you know you have somebody like tertullian who's as critical of violence as and war as anybody ever uh you know he he writes these really powerful statements about the barbarity of the empire and and the cruelty of of the armies and all these things but then he also has these kind of like conciliatory statements like some of the some of those early christians they they say statements like because we see the Caesar ordained by God, he is more our Caesar than yours. And we're no threat to the Caesar. We're no threat to the empire. We're good for you. We pray for the peace of the empire because they saw this principle that, that it was true to a large extent that order was being maintained and sustained through the empire. It was making like if nothing else, trade routes that that were stable, so that you could travel from Rome to to Asia Minor and and have a good chance of making it to your destination without being killed on the way by robber barons. Like just that much stability was huge for the value of the church and for the spread of the gospel. Just the inter international commerce and the ability to move goods from one place to another allowed the ideas of the gospel to move from one place to another mm -hmm. like this order and stability is a central factor to the prosperity of the church and they recognize it as such they know the more order there is in the world the more room we have to work and even even when that order the the order that was preserving the the empire that was preserving that order had them under the gun it was still it didn't change the equation that order in the world was still being maintained and making a way for the church to spread. So, so, but then, but then I, I think that the, the, the church's teachings and practices are supposed to be timeless. 
And I always put myself like, how how's a first century Christian going to vote for Nero or his or, or some some local senator from his area to go in and, and enact the, the coming wars and 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 the council for for the coming year that's going to prosecute the wars of the empire over the next 12 months? Like that's an absurdity. When you put it in that construct, it's absolutely absurd. You can't ever imagine a first century Christian part, responsible for the election of the new Caesar. It, it, it's in, yeah. it's inconceivable. I think some Christians these days could, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, but shame on them. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. l- like there's no pretense in the empire. Yeah. You know that yeah. the wars of expansion are going to continue you know that the conquest of the barbarians is going to continue to be prosecuted. You know that the Roman swords are going to be dipped in the blood of the, of the heathenish people to the North. Like that's going to happen. And it's going to happen for America too. We're going to keep exacting our empire at the cost of blood of people who can't resist us and can't resist our power. Like it, it's, it, that is literally what it means to make America great again. It's mm-hmm. to return to our empiric expansion. It's to return to dipping our swords in the blood of those who can't resist us to extract yeah. their resources. Yeah. I, I understand what keeps Christians from being able to see that for what it is, but that, that ignorance doesn't make it any less damaging to, 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 to Jesus's reputation when Christian don't people don't see that and continue to yeah. perpetuate it. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it going back a little bit to politics and, and, and more practically like how we interact with politics. Um, I think just kind of making some assumptions from what you've described and what I know you to believe, I think a lot of it, comes back to violence like the christian can't participate in politics because politics inevitably they're intrinsically violent yeah right um so a lot of people don't grant that yeah so so how what would what would you say to somebody who's like well i could well and and it gets complicated in america because the post office is is a government entity the you know um the library or whatever, you know, right. th- there's a lot of things that aren't, or even like the school board or, you right. know, other spheres of influence in your community that maybe you could participate in and it, and you could help bring about good things for your community that maybe aren't as directly related to violence. Would you, um, in theory, like if, if you were in education or something, right. um, run for a school board or whatever. Yeah. Like, like, and, and, you know, carry it out to other offices, you know, not just the school board. Yeah. I, I don't know where to set the lower limit. I certainly know where the upper limits are, <clears throat> but, but what I'm always looking for is where, where is, how, how is the control being maintained? Because, organization and control there's a fine line between those two things so so for instance people often try to criticize my perspective by saying well so does that mean you can't vote for you don't ever vote in your church for whether you want to have meetings on tuesday or thursday or pray before or after meeting or have a potluck or any of those things well well see the thing is that like there's no coercion like if I don't like having a potluck on Sunday, I just don't go. Yeah. Like nobody's force. Nobody's going to show up at my door, and and confiscate my property or throw me right. in jail if I don't show up at the potluck on Sunday. It's a free will exchange, and 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 I think to to the extent that we can create free will associations, we can be involved. Mm-hmm. But wherever wherever the the underlying authority here's an important principle to me there's certain caricatures that we make in the in the bible like the pharisee the pharisee um sure you know it's 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 sad uh that most of us don't read the apocrypha and we don't know where the pharisees come from like we don't know the whole story of how we get from 
-hmm. the minor prophets to the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. People have lost that part of, uh, of Hebrew history. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, Jesus and his contemporaries didn't, and that's why everybody's named Judas in the gospel narratives, because Judas Maccabeus yeah. was the hero of, of everybody's yeah. cultural zeitgeist. Like everybody loved Judas Maccabeus. He's like the man. That's why everybody's named Judas. But, but the Pharisee is the faithful. He, he's the, that group of people were the ones who were right. They weren't these Dracula styled monsters under capes and phylacteries that we think of when we grow up reading the gospel narrative, yeah. they were the good guys. They were the really, really good guys. They were the ones that were good when everybody else was bad. And, and, and without that piece, you kind of miss the narrative. You miss mm -hmm. what's happening when Jesus says your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Like that doesn't mean be better than the bad guys. It means be better than the best people that you know of. You have mm -hmm. to be better than the best example of what you think is the pinnacle of religious uh, experience. Mm -hmm. There's another, um, where was I going? There's another caricature. Um, mm, I just lost it, Chris. Um, Pharisees. Um, what was the point we were chasing? Um, local involvement in politics. Uh, I don't remember. I had, sorry. I, that's all right. I, I got two side, I got two soapboxed and yeah. lost my track. <laughs> but I think right. going back to the point uh, yeah. about coercive structures is that there's um, wherever tax is involved, force is involved. That's the currency of state. And so, so, so I think that when I look at something and I say, well, what about local participation? Okay. We don't want to, we don't want to elect Caesar. We don't want to support mm -hmm. his wars. Let's, let's just take that off the table. Sure. And, and probably our senators and congressmen are just as complicit in that blood as the president, but local matters, right? So what about my community? What about my neighborhood? What about the, 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 the needs, the real legitimate needs that are right in front of me that we can collectivize and find solutions to? Isn't that a valuable Christian enterprise? If we look at something like a, a, a bond measure for a firehouse or a library, what, what we're saying in essence is that the majority of people are going to exact by force the, the means of production for that commodity for the community. And it may very well be a good thing for the community to have a new firehouse or a new library, but I don't feel like I can preserve my, my Christian principles and exact those means and resources from my neighbor who may not be willing at the point of a gun. What I'm doing in any time that I in any time that I engage in in something that has to do with with legislation that includes penalties or or taxes is that I'm leveraging the guns of government against my neighbor who may or may not agree with that principle. And up to half of the people that live around me may not be willing to do what I have now required them to do. And the same applies with moral legislation. Like if I'm forcing people to defend marriage, have I really defended marriage? If I'm forcing people to yeah. do whatever, like I grant that the state has the power to do those things. I grant that the state has the power to protect its borders, to decide what's what are legal infractions and what the penalties may be. That's their domain to do. But I, I, it's not my domain to do. I've been called to a separate order and my order dictates that we have a different way of resolving. We have a different way of resolving those problems in my community. And I think it's really a lack of creativity on the church's end that has caused us to resort to statecraft instead of creative ministry sure. to resolve the problems in our communities. Yeah, yeah. So what would you say then, you know, classic kind of example or, or argument would be, you know, someone's coming in and stealing your, well, stealing your stuff. I feel like I know your answer to that, but, um, you know, 
pardon the the graphic illustration but like raping your wife or like uh-huh. abusing your children or whatever um you don't believe in violence right and you don't participate in the political structures um like how how are you going to handle that are you going to call 911 right. are you going to you know pray for them throw yourself in front of your wife and kids or whatever like yeah. how I know that's kind of a an, an overused hypothetical, but like it, it's right. Kind of well, a, that's my first hurdle. answer is always how many people do you know whose wives have been raped that way? Yeah, I've never even heard of anybody on a personal level that's experienced anything like that. Um, but but that doesn't mean it can't exist. When when we talk about these kinds of hypotheticals, it's it, I think it's if it's it's appropriate to ask hypotheticals. It's appropriate to ground them within a hypothetical world, like. Sure. <clears throat> it, it, okay, let's talk about different cases. There's a there's a fantastic book um, called Dial Nine One One. I think the subtitle is something like Stories of Non Nonviolent Christians in a Violent uh, World. It's a fantastic book. Dave Jackson is the author. Dave Jackson mm-hmm. was an elder for a time at uh, among at Reba Place. Okay. Um, Dial 911 is a fantastic book because it's a it's an intentional community of people get this it was three up to 300 people in the 80s living uh, un, with a common purse all within 10 blocks of each other interesting super neat yeah. story and background um what so what they were wrestling with is that they were they came from kind of the liberal mennonite tradition or at least when the liberal mennonite tradition was developing in the 60s and 70s mm-hmm. and and they were interested in a lot of social justice issues and especially prison reform and so they felt like being in a high crime area if they were to if they were t- to engage the law enforcement community they were subjecting their enemies to violence and they didn't feel conscionable about that but this creates a real dilemma right so if if a guy breaks into my house tonight and maybe he hits my wife and he takes a bunch of my stuff and he runs out the door and I say, Hey, we're Christians. We're going to pray for him. We're going to forgive him. But then tomorrow he breaks into my neighbor's house who may or may not be a Christian and hurts his wife and takes his stuff. Am I morally responsible Mm -hmm. because there's a domain and authority that has jurisdiction over that event that I didn't do my part to witness to. And this is what this community is dealing with in this high crime area in Mm -hmm. Evanston, Illinois. And so, so they wrestle with this and they're, they're not wrestling with it academically. It's a real life experience that's happening in their communities. And they're trying to decide, you know, they're dealing with it in a lot of different ways. I mean, and, and in that super kind of fun, like Shane Claiborne kind of creative application way like nothing's off the table like maybe we Mm -hmm. should learn judo let's no that's not gonna work maybe we should do this they talked about you know uh what kind of property should they own like are we inviting are we inviting criminal um problems into our Mm -hmm. lives by the possessions that we own maybe we should restrict our property in order to not have to engage with law enforcement. So all kinds of really beautiful, creative solutions. And I love Mm -hmm. seeing God's people. This is where I want us to be. I want Mm -hmm. us to be engaging in these issues in real time where Mm -hmm. we have to step out, say "Mm, that doesn't work and step back and say, let's reassess and let's try something else. I feel like, I feel like the American church has lost this creative sense of wonder about the teachings of Jesus. Like, what can these things do? Like, instead of looking at it as censure and what we can't do, we we've lost the art Mm -hmm. of taking Jesus's teachings and saying, what can like, like colors, what can we make in the world around us with these principles of Jesus's teachings? That kind of childish wonder at Jesus's teachings has been by and large lost. Yeah. What they ended up resolving and, and they're, they're, quick to say this is a particular application of our particular situation our particular place but where they landed is they felt like they got to know the people involved with juvenile justice and felt like it was very redemptive 
Like okay. the juvenile detention system was trying to fix people's lives. It was putting people in educational mm -hmm. environments and giving them social workers and trying to reclaim lives out of lives of crime and into something meaningful and useful, at least to the extent where they felt like they could, they could engage with it and participate in it. So if it was a young person who broke into their home, they would call the police. If it was an older criminal, they felt like they were just subjecting that person to more violence by engaging with law enforcement and they wouldn't call the police. That's, that's just a practical solution that they m made up out of their environment and situation. And I find that very Christ honoring way to approach those kinds of questions. The other, th you know, like what we've been talking about um, in our circles a lot over the last year, two years is, is crimes against children that are happening mm. in Christian circles. Yeah. I was just going to go there. Yeah. I, I get asked about it quite often. And I think that what I, what I always try to talk about in regards to that is that non-resistance is not non-involvement mm -hmm. that, that we should be, that it's not non-resistant if it's, if it's drawing away what Jesus is doing in non-resistance is getting involved. He's putting himself in the middle of the problem. And wherever we see proper uh, kingdom ethics happening, it will be God's people getting themselves in the middle of the problem. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what the solution is. They don't mm -hmm. know how to fix the problem, but they're not going to walk away. That's the thing that's most important. So, so I think it's better to talk about when we when we discuss the issue of hypotheticals is let's talk about some real practical mm -hmm. resolutions. Yeah. My my daughters were on the subway uh, a couple years ago, weren't even baptized yet, just young girls. They were they were mm -hmm. going down to Boston and and there's a guy that's bothering this young girl. She turned out to be 15 years old. He's touching her. He's bothering her. She's ma he's making her very uncomfortable. A train full of people. Uh, full of people that presumably believe in retributive violence and protective violence and all this stuff. Nobody's doing anything. Everybody's going to read their paper. Everybody's going to pretend like it's a domestic situation. They don't want to get involved. Don't want to get involved. Yeah. But my daughters see this situation. My daughters are trained that, that, that what it means to be involved in kingdom ethics is to get in the middle. So my daughters see this, they get up from where they're, they're at. They come over, they say, Hey, come and sit with us. They bring her to sit in the middle of them. Now they're in the middle of it. Yeah. Dinner. This guy's now he's bothered by all three of them. He's, yeah. he's continuing to be aggressive at the, they stop at a train station at the last minute before the doors close. Chloe grabs the girl's hand. They all three run off the train just before he can and the door shut and away he goes. These kinds of situations That's are beautiful. what the, yeah. this is what non-resistance is. Yeah. It's getting involved. And yeah. I feel like if we in faith and obedience get in the middle of the situations that are difficult, that are the middle of the situations that are the problem, it doesn't guarantee a positive outcome for us. Those girls could have been hurt. That yeah. we, if we're not real about that, like, hey, that, that those two guys got involved in Portland several years ago, three or four years ago, some guy was going crazy with a knife uh, and accosting a Muslim girl. Two guys got involved. Both of them died from knife to knife stabs in the heart. Like it doesn't always, it's not always happy endings, but it, but the Christian response is always to be in the middle, to always be willing to pay the price, to yeah. always put myself on the line. And in any of these situations, whether it's an intruder in my home or violence on the streets, the question for the Christian community is how do we get in the middle? And I think if we stay true to that notion, that's where we'll find grace. That's where we'll find miraculous provision. That's where we'll find God. And so that's my answer to the hypotheticals. Yeah, no, that's that's powerful. Um, it reminds me. I want to I want to come back to the the whole children and kind of the current right. conversation. Yeah, um, I do too. Actually, there's more I want to say about that. But it, it reminds me of I kind of had had a moment. Oh man, it was uh, spring of 2019. I've kind of alluded to this a little bit on social media, just how 2019 was kind of a rough year for me. It was kind of nothing really specifically happened. It was just kind of a culmination of of a lot of things and kind right. of the realization that some theology that I had kind of bought into what had had kind of wreaked havoc, um, I think, without me realizing it. Anyways, that's another conversation that we might touch on if we have time. Um, but 
um, I was sitting in a class. So I was really struggling with Jesus and really struggling with this concept of the goodness of God and the goodness of Jesus. And, yeah. and I was sitting in a class, um, a bunch of generous people that I don't entirely even know to this day who they were. I have some suspicions paid for my way to um, go sit in a course that Reagan Schrock's organization puts on. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about all the safety things. So I don't, I don't want to name the organization, but um, right. he was, he was given a class on the cure for terrorism and, and he was basically giving that whole concept of getting in the middle. I don't think he used those words, but this idea that nonviolence, non-resistance, radical enemy, enemy love is, is an active thing. And what would happen? He was, I think, giving some ideas of like what Christians could do specifically in the Middle East right. to, um, to kind of combat un, undo work against what Americans typically do in the Middle East. Right. right. Um, and, and giving ideas of like, you know, what if we, you know, would go in, in there into the, the most violent parts and like clean up the minefields or like all these things to help the people there, rather than to to harm them and, and hinder them even though they consider us enemies and they might kill us even right. as we're trying to help them out you know and i mean there's a whole thing of, of savior complex there that that um we don't want to participate in but that whole concept of jesus jesus like jesus's love is a real thing in his his people are supposed to exemplify that. And that's how he is redeeming the world. Cause like, I, I have all these questions, like kind of an overarching question that I have and that I'm kind of even in this conversation trying to get at is if we're not supposed to participate in the systems the world has for justice, then how do we do justice? Like how do we as Christian people do justice, which is a question I would love to hear you talk, talk about, but, but I just, I kind of, to use kind of a, a, a cheesy emotional phrasing, I kind of fell in love with Jesus again in a way that I had kind of known before, but like, I just realized like Jesus and his kingdom and his people are people of, of love. And that's how we change the world. We change the world by right. loving our enemies. Right. And, and so it, it, it casts vision. It gives me something to lean into. It gives me something to pursue. Um, and I, I just think it's it's beautiful. Anyways, um, I would I would love to hear you talk about kind of going back to the whole um, children thing and kind of what's going on, especially particularly among our conservative Anabaptist circles. Like when we realize all the abuse that is happening, um, like what what is our response supposed to be? It, right. In especially in our relationship to to government and the world right of justice. So the way that I the way that I think about this is that when we look at those domains of authority uh, um let me let me lay out a let me lay out a premise and then I'll 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 talk about what I, how I think that works. Sure. And what the problems with it are. If somebody is the law is for the lawless. Like those those existing the the sword bearers are there for a legitimate purpose their purpose and function is to create this order and and to protect the innocent presumably at its best when when that so just like the guy breaking into my house and then breaking into my neighbors Mm -hmm. i think the resolution to that as i see it is that we have an obligation to the authority to witness at, at least to things that are causing harm in the world. Um, how much how much property destruction or or, or stealing is is harm in the world is uh, you know that's that's you have to decide when you're there. But at least where people are being harmed, I think the church has an obligation to witness to the state who has a legitimate claim to take authority in that situation. For the per- for their purposes, so if somebody's hurting children, that's under the domain of the sword bearers. They deserve their their place 
to do their job in regards to that harm to the community. That's why they're there. So when we when we know about those things, I feel like we have a moral obligation to the state to give them their proper due, to give them their proper place. And so when people are being harmed, especially the state has an obligation, but this has twofold purpose. It's not just so the state can have her domain, but it's also so, this, so that the church can do her work because what it means for that person who's the perpetrator to repent means to bring those things to light. And so in both cases, with the authority of the church and the authority of the state, what those events that were harmful to other people have to come to light in both spheres in order to make it whole or as whole as it can be made. And so the, 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 the good, the best thing to be able to come out of all of these traumatic situations that we've heard about over the last while are that I think it's caused it's caused us to reconsider our role in all of that and to reconsider our responsibility. And I know for like in the cam situation, what what I, I was very I was very, very upset about what happened in Haiti. Um, I have had friends that served in Haiti uh, uh, with cam and and not with cam. And I've done my own fair bit of work with CAM. We, we run SALT programs in, in Uganda. I, I spent two years doing an IC project, building housing for refugees. And there's a lot of things. Uh, the, the individuals that I worked with at CAM are, are top-notch saints of God. They're phenomenal people doing really, really Jesus-centered things. And for all of that to be thrown into into question with these actions both i th i think honestly from cam's administrative people who who were involved in the decisions to allow these things to go on and and the perpetrator himself and that whole dynamic of what happened there it, 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 it was a testimony of how much can be ruined by by one person's sin or a few people's sin yeah and i i um, but what, a, what, so with all of that brewing inside of me, you know, as a brother in this church and as somebody involved in cam work, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to send letters. I wanted to back out of our programs. I wanted to defund. I wanted to do a lot of those things. Those are my natural impulse. And then, you know, as we talked about as a brotherhood, we said, we said let's let's see what happens before before we do that and and then we'll respond and then i after after i gave myself a little space i said well what would i do if it was followers away instead of cam like what if that had happened in our midst like what would i what would i do and how would i respond mm -hmm. and then also how do i prevent what are there any things that i can do to prevent that from happening at followers away whether it, at home or in abroad and it caused, I, I thank God for it, it caused a real introspective look to reassess how, where are we at with these things. I actually, I, I shared, uh, we have, you know, I don't know how, how much you know about Fathers Away, but we have, we meet in small congregations because we do weekly communion in small groups throughout the church every week. And so we have seven congregations here that meet across Boston every week. Mm -hmm. And um, we do from time to time gather all the congregations together for what we call citywide meetings. And it's, it's things that are important that we want to as decentralized as we are, there's some important things that we want to be together on. And that's what we have citywide meetings for. And uh, I was, I, I was able to talk to the whole church at one of our citywide meetings uh, specifically about the issue of abuse and to draw some clear lines among us about these exact things that if someone is hurt, the the government has proper domain to know and and without question of who it is or what the circumstances are if someone's hurt they get to know it's their job mm -hmm. it's their right and it's our moral obligation to let them in to that domain mm -hmm. 
just so that there's no question. I also think it's important to, to talk openly and honestly about sexual problems and about sexual perversion and about healthy sexual appetites and like these taboo subjects for Christian people, they shouldn't be taboo among us. Mm -hmm. We should be able to use those words and we should be able to use them in front of children. They should know what they mean. And it shouldn't be something behind dark corners that we whisper about these things. And, and, and especially because we don't know where there could be harm happening. And I want, like at that meeting, I, I spoke specifically to children and said, you know, I want, all of our children to know to be touched in an inappropriate way is not okay. And, and you should hear it from the church. Mm -hmm. Somebody could be in that situation and we don't know. And maybe, and if you're grown up in that environment, or if you're subject to those kinds of forces, you think that's just how it is for everybody. And you need to hear from some external source. It's not okay. And there are people who will help you resolve the problem in a right way you can come and you can talk, you'll be heard, you'll be listened to, and we can find solutions. And I think that that ought to be a common call in all of our churches. And dealing with sexual perversion and sexual addiction ought to be talked about openly as well. I mean, I think a big part of the problem that happened in the Haiti case is that people come back and I've seen, I've sat in Anabaptist meetings where somebody has uh, a confession and it's, I have a, I have a sex, I have a lust problem or some kind of euphemism. And that means in this case that you were attacking children. And so most of the people think he's looking at pornography when he's actually been abusing children and nobody's the wiser and they just assume everybody's working through it in proper ways and they're going to find resolution and then they'll repent and then they'll go back yeah. on about their business. Yeah. And nobody's dealing with the fact that people are actually being hurt all, all yeah. along the way. So those are some like really important lessons, I think, to take away from this. And I think those mm -hmm. are applications of non-resistance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's understanding these principles of authority mm -hmm. in a proper way so that, so that God can do what he means to do with all these different spheres. Mm -hmm. and, and we can address all of them from a redemptive perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it. It's interesting, like w one thing that that just strikes me as I as I listen to you talk about kind of all of these aspects kind of coming at it from from a, a holistic view, I guess, um, is how how kind of exciting it is. Like, um, like I, I know, like I we as Americans and um maybe particularly myself and my personality type can kind of romanticize things and be like, Oh, that sounds, that sounds exciting. And then when we get into it, it's, it's nitty gritty. Um, but just, just the idea that like, it's way more compelling to me to be like, I actually, I can actually do something. Um, and like my, my belief systems actually, like I can live them out and actually make a difference right. um, in my, my beliefs, my Jesus views, the way I live my life um, can actually make a tangible difference. Um, right. Even if it's, even if it's, you know, a small amount within my sphere. Um, and I, I don't know, that's just, that's way more exciting to me than, than just kind of the concept of get saved and, Right. You know, live the American dream. Like I, I, I have no, like when people leave Anabaptism or whatever, and they just pick up like mainstream evangelical American dream. It's just like, why would you do that? Like that, that's so boring to me. Like if I, if I walked away from my faith, that's not where I would go. Like, right. right. Um, yeah. I feel you, brother. I, 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 I geek out on this stuff. I can talk about it yeah. all day, every day. It's yeah. I've never been bored as a Christian. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's so much to do and there's so many, yeah. there's, there's so many opportunities in, to, to be, to be planting and, and, and watering and reaping for God. I, one of the, one of the things I think that, that gets in, in the way of a lot of people, it, it is connected to our Americanness. And I think it's, it's, it's some kind of grandiose notions and, and, and maybe we could springboard off of this into, into missiology, mm -hmm. but I, I think there's, we have, we do have these kind of like 
I want to be the biggest and the best. I want to save the world. I want to be, I want to make a big mark. I want my life to matter. Mm-hmm. I don't know that. The, I, I think some of that's human. Like we mm-hmm. see the disciples doing it. I want to sit at your right hand. I want to be out mm-hmm. front. I want to be the best. And, and what we don't see is Jesus negating that desire. He says, okay, sure. if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, here's how you do it. Yeah. And he flips all of their expectations about what that means upside down, mm-hmm. especially by the time he's on a cross. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't nullify their desire to want their life to matter, especially mm-hmm. for God and their, and, the, and their devotion to Christ himself. And so I don't want to suppress that, but I also think that that we're generally very bad at the long game. Like we want big splashes mm-hmm. and, and, and long, slow work is not our forte as a culture mm-hmm. or, and as a, as a, as a people in the church. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that I, 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 my hope is that we can see w- I, I, I want amazing things like, because I have big eyes. I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to change the world. I yeah. recognize that impulse within me. Mm-hmm. I also recognize that a part of it's ego mm-hmm. and, and separating those two things is really difficult to do. How hard is it to have God dwelling in you and separate your own desires from his when we were when we're trying to build holistic lives around Christ and his gospel where do you separate the line between god's desires and intentions and your own it's not a line it's more like a marsh it's like a marshy border it's like it cuts in and out and back and forth and around and it's not a hard line and mm-hmm. and and i think that the intention that God has in that marshy border between his will and ours, as we grow in him is that he wants to walk with us throughout that process. He wants to, he wants it to be a conversation. He wants it to be an interaction between him and us to, to explore and understand Mm -hmm. his will in relation to ours and vice versa. But, but I want to be, I want the, the, the way, one of the biggest ways that I try to put a check on my ego is to say, well, what am I doing today? Like, what are the things that are meaningful that I'm doing from day to day? What am I building my life out of? Like, maybe there's a big splash down the de- down the road. Maybe I'm going to be a martyr. Maybe I'm going to be a bishop. Maybe I'm going to do this. Maybe I'm going to do that. But what am I, if there's any hope of getting to those places, to those big places, It's got to be built out of a thousand small places. It's got to be built out of doing things every day that are meaningful to the kingdom of God. And, and, and am I content with worship? Am I content Mm -hmm. with just being full of God Mm -hmm. in my daily life? Am I content being with him? Am I content with loving my neighbor when he's a jerk? Am I content with, yeah. suppressing my own yeah. frustrations with my friends and my wife and my mm-hmm. children. Am I content with taking the lower spot in my brotherhood? Like those aren't small yeah. things, even yeah. though they're not observable. Yeah. And I think getting our eyes off of, off of the big splash and building those dis- disciplines, learning that non-resistance is not primarily about who I kill or don't kill. Mm-hmm. It's about, how much can I control my own emotions in a high stakes emotional environment with my wife or my children or in a conflict with a neighbor or a friend or a brother, that's where you build. That's where you build the muscles to know what to do when they come knocking down your door. Yeah. Wow. It, um, kind of it i mean that's that's very much some some things that i've i've been processing myself like um well i i grew up very much kind of in the kind of the mission um what's the term like the mission circles of anabaptism you know right i grew up under 
great men of faith who, who, you know, picked up their families and went overseas or went, right. you know, you know, I grew up in Northern Minnesota, which back in the sixties the and seventies was kind of a mission right. uh, spot and, and, and just across the border from Northern Ontario. And so, so there's reserves. And then, you know, my family, went with Destinations International and their BMA to Los Angeles. And my dad had a vision to plant inner city churches. And so like, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the teaching and a lot of the strategy, which isn't all bad, but it's, it's all about like, how effective can we be? How, you know, if, especially when you're talking with evangelists, people who, who just love to preach the gospel, right. They want to get up on the tallest point and preach to the most people. And so, right. so you're thinking, the bigger my platform, the more people hear the gospel. And that's a good thing. Right. Um, right. And that's a lot of the, the focus when you're kind of in those circles and real realizing it, and then combine that with American celebrity culture. Right. And, and mega church uh, culture and you, stardom you, and fandom. Right. Exactly. And then, and then combine that with our own personal egos, then, then our desire to, to see the world impacted and, and to do that strategically and, and to reach as many people as possible combined with our ego in our, in our culture that's built around celebrities, um, you get, you get distracted and then you see all of these celebrities one by one, you know, fall and fail right. and, and right. completely wash out. Um, and I've just been realizing, you know, you know like I, I have no interest in that. Like I have no interest in um, what, like it, when I really analyze the people who have impacted me the most and the people who have impacted the neighborhoods I've lived in the most are the people who are just your everyday hard workers who are faithfully right. living out the gospel and, and who are there, who are present when, you know, somebody overdoses or, right. um, or, they, you know, they can't make rent or they, um, or for me, like when I'm going through a, a spell of confusion or frustration or whatever, and I, I go to them, like, it's not, it's not the celebrity. I'm not DMing whoever, you know, and getting their attention. It's the person, the everyday person who's in my life, who, who exactly the, the impact. And so it's like, okay, they're actually having the influence that actually changes the world. Like, I'm not, I'm not discounting you know, Billy Graham and whoever, you know, whatever they, they did in preaching the gospel. Um, you know, I think, I think there is a place for that, but, but like, as far as like everyday life, radical change, change, it, it happens in the everyday. From the apostolic era to the third century, I can name probably 25 saints, maybe 30. And that's a church that took over the Roman Empire. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and what that wow. means to me yeah. is that there were thousands of Christians living their normal life in their neighborhood, and that's what the church was made out of. Wow. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was just guys living their life and raising their family and, 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 and trying to meet needs in their community and speaking faithfully and giving mm -hmm. an answer for the hope that lied in them. That's really like I think it it takes a few Tertullians and Origins and Cyprians and Pauls and and some of those people like they're they they get the church over the hump for different purposes in different times, but it's it's not the church isn't built out of those guys. They're just the ones that get their names written down. There's thousands and thousands. Mm -hmm. Like we're we're going to realize when we know as well as we're known who the real notables in the kingdom of God mm -hmm. are, because they're not people whose names we know for, for throughout the Christian epoch, mm -hmm. it's always been people who are faithful in their domain, who are willing to be what God wants them to be where they are. And that capacity, like that's only born out of contentment and, and peace and, and, and a, a, an ability to abide where I am and to know, know I'm in the center of what God wants me to be doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, cultivating, the more we cultivate that, I think, mm -hmm. I think the better we are, you know, there's something about that whole mentality 
I, I have, uh, so, so I've spent a good bit of time in Uganda, I've done some work there. We have a, we have a church community there. And so at the risk of, of, of sounding a little bit hypocritical, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of, of Westerners doing church work in the developing world. What I think is that, uh, are you familiar with KP Yohannan's Revolution World Missions? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, fantastic book. And the premise is, quit sending Americans to Indian jungles. Let us train Indian preachers to go to Indian jungles. And that's sure. way more efficient. Mm -hmm. Take I can KP is basically saying, I can make 100 Indian missionaries for the cost of you all sending one white guy over here. Yeah. Phenomenal. It is revolutionary from the from the Western missionary models perspective. It's yeah. it's counterintuitive. I think that there's a part B okay. to that revolution in world missions. And what I think it is, is that what we're not doing well is leveraging the access that we do have as Westerners. What we ought to be doing is working within whatever developing world community we want to work with within American metro or European metro environments because they're all here. Mm -hmm. Like we, you don't have to go to Vietnam to work with Vietnamese people. You don't have to go to Laos to work with Laotians. You don't have to go to Eritrea to work with Eritreans. They're all here. Mm -hmm. They're in LA, they're in Denver, mm -hmm. they're in Chicago, they're in Boston, they're in New York, they're in London. They're all over our our places there's there's a, a multitude of reasons to think this way first of all one of the most perplexing problems of westerners doing developing world church work is how do you untangle especially in post-colonial countries how do you untangle whiteness from the gospel mm -hmm. It's nearly impossible it's not impossible but it's very 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 thorny issue uh, I, I, I don't have time to go into all the ramifications of that, mm -hmm. but but it's very hard to untangle Western whiteness from the gospel and the church in post-colonial countries. Mm -hmm. The two things are so intertwined. Like I used to think, I used to think the biggest problem in that scenario was like uh, false motives, false conversion, the, mm -hmm. the pejoratively called rice Christians. It's probably not a very good term. We should speak better of people, but, but that concept of people that are coming just for access to resource. I used to think that false motives were the most thorny part about that, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's the genuine motives behind that. Like if, if I'm, if I'm, um, if I'm in the developing world, I don't care where the majority world. And I have two choices. I'm a, I'm a, a young Christian man with a starting family and just living in subsistence lifestyle. I have an, I have an opportunity to go to church a or church B and church a is connected to Westerners and, and resources and church B is not. It's almost, it's almost immoral to go to church B like, because I presume that I'm going to have some kind of needs in my life or my children am, why wouldn't I go it, all things the same? Like yeah. if it's church or church, church A or church B, why wouldn't I go to the one that has more opportunity and access? Yeah, of course you are. That yeah. doesn't make that doesn't make you a rice Christian. That doesn't make you have false motives. That just means you're living in a difficult environment and you're yeah. making sensible choices. So how do you disentangle that then from the church with Western influence and Western resources? You can't. There, there's all kinds of complexities behind that that don't get worked out for. It takes years to resolve that. And I don't know if you ever entirely do. But what I do know is that there are people from the majority world in every one of our metro areas. And in my area, if you want to work with any ethnic community, just about Pick a country in the world. If you want to work with those people, they're here. And they're certainly in New York. Saudis, Arabs, Iraqis, Syrians, mm -hmm. South Americans, anybody, anywhere in the world you want to work with, they're here. If you make converts of those ethnic communities here, 
they have already passed all of those steps to decolonialize their Christianity. They're already here. They have yeah. no incentive to listen to you because you're a Westerner, because they already live here. Yeah. And if they're willing to go back to their own people and do church work among their own kind, they're not having to deal with the cultural issues, the language issues, mm -hmm. and they've already pre-selected themselves as rejecting the the good that they could have in, in with their mm -hmm. American visa to go back to their own. It makes sense in every way for us yeah. to be focusing our efforts and our energies on doing our church work. And not only that, but the thing that's really grieved me with our view of missiology is that if I can be frank, we send, we send untested kids to yeah. the, to the developing world to do the hardest work of the church. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm always like, you know, if you don't, if you haven't, if you haven't already been successful at making disciples and you're really good at it among your own culture and language and place, why are we exporting? Yeah. Like you have to prove yourself capable, qualified, and so qualified that you're worth sending over to do it in with all the rigors and difficulties of a different language and a different yeah. cultural and a different environment. That's who we should be sending over. <coughs> but it's not. It's yeah. very sincere, very godly young people yeah. who are ambitious enough to go. Yeah. And I, that just doesn't make sense. It's yeah. not a, it's not an efficient way to do what yeah. our job is. Yeah. I fear that a lot of our conservative churches have lost touch with the mission of the church. And so we're not thinking very sensibly yeah. or about, we're just glad somebody's willing to go. Right. Like a person willing to go is better than no people willing to go. Yeah. So whoever's willing to sign on the line, we'll send. And we're not thinking, we're not putting our, 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 our mission forward, our reason yeah. for being forward and, and collectively saying, what's the best way to do this job? Yeah. One thing I remember I go talking about when I was a student there was, I think it was I go. Yeah. But I, I don't remember them really expounding on it much, but the idea that like Barnabas and Paul, what, what was it in Ephesus were, Okay, now I'm doubting my my understanding of the of the timeline, but basically the, the idea that Paul, I think it was Paul and Barnabas in Ephesus were pastoring there, and they they stayed, you know, for however many years it was, and then the church sent them out and commissioned them as missionaries. Not they didn't they didn't keep the old pastors and and apostles to to mentor the church back home and then send out their younglings to do mission work. They I'm assuming they trained up young guys, local Ephesians, and then Paul and Barnum, you know, they sent and prayed over Paul right. and Barnabas. And then at Antioch, went. not Ephesus. Yeah. Sorry. It was Antioch. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. They were and, seasoned men by the time yeah. they were sent out by the church. Yeah. Experienced, had been through some real difficult situations, had proven their mettle, had proven yep. their faithfulness. It, yeah. And it just is, it seems like, that was the way they did mission work was send out the seasoned people. Right. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I kind of, I kind of want to, missiology is something we could go down a rabbit hole. Um, I, I kind of want to touch on a few things yet before, um, before you have to go. I don't know how, how, how literally should I take your, your. Well, I'm a night owl. I don't okay. know what you're going to do with all this content, but it's, I guess we're at what two hours now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hey, if that sounds good to me, I am a night owl. I have to wake up early tomorrow morning, but it's a half day, so I think I can. Uh, Where are you going, Bob? Think I can survive. Okay, love you. So, um, yeah, please. I'm trying. Sorry. I'm looking. I'm looking at my notes here. We've kind of come down to the place where I just started throwing in ideas, <laughs> and I, it is. I'm trying to. I want it to be coherent, but um, the, so I, I'm interested in hearing, okay, where can we go with this? I, I, I maybe want to end with just kind of a summary, your idea of, of church witness, um, kind of talking more specifically, how do we do justice? Um, and we can maybe end on that. Um, 
I'm, I'm interested in hearing you talk about protesting, but while we're talking about um, missiology, um, I'm curious about this is this is <laughs> this is gonna be like a sharp turn for our listeners, um, no doubt. But um, given some of the conversations we've had in dank dank memes um, and just on Facebook in general. Um, I'm interested to hear your perspective of demonology, um, and and I, and and just like how does what is your kingdom? Maybe maybe there's not a kingdom position on it or whatever, but like as Jesus is king, mm-hmm. and and what you know what is the play between the physical and the spiritual and what dominion does Satan have when we call something satanic? Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest. Um, like I, I was influenced heavily by like, there would have been a, a time in place where I could have very easily, I think just completely bought into ch- charisma, charismatic right. kind of approach to, to, um, right. I was I was really influenced by Steve Stussman. I really looked up to him, um, and and so this this idea that you know you can give ground to the enemy if if you you know depending on you know what 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 books you read or what ideas you subscribe to or you know whatever what truth you believe or disbelieve. Um, so I'm just curious. We don't have to dismantle their theology right just more like what what is my take this, on that yeah what's your take on it what is the spiritual realm um well i i don't think that there's a i don't think there's a a, a pat kingdom answer nor do i sure. feel like i'm i'm able to answer for kingdom sure. people yeah but, but i'll tell you what my view of it is yeah. for whatever that's worth um I am charismatic. I speak in tongues, so I, I believe in 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 current manifestations of, of of the giftings of spirit, and I believe in supernatural things. I believe in I believe in healing. I believe in miracles, and I believe in demons. Um, I I have I have spent a lot of my life working on the streets with people in addiction and with mental health problems, and it's very difficult for me to differentiate between things that are supernaturally derived and things that are physically derived in, especially in regards to those two domains. I think there's a lot of overlap, Mm -hmm. but I also think there's a lot of overlap with in, in outside of the individual in these broad, like global cosmic concerns. I think that when the, when, when Paul talks about powers and principalities and rulers of darkness, there's a concept there in the Greek. It's a, it's kind of an obscure term. It's to kia to cosmu powers of the world. And, and there's something happening above the physical. There's something that involves angels and demons at a level. That's like the closest glimpse. I think that we get of it is in Daniel where, you know, there's these clashes between these powers and there's conflict happening I, I don't know much about any of that. I think that my experiences with gifts and 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 dark supernatural forces. My wife come came out of the occult. It was experiences in the occult that caused her to 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 turn to Christ and and to become a Christian. I I've I've been involved in a few exorcisms let me tell you my my early experiences um i had charismatic experiences a few years after i was converted uh and i come from a very non-charismatic fundamental baptist perspective so it wasn't something i i was courting necessarily um my first experiences with someone off the streets that was demon possessed that i was involved with uh pastorally was like uh, it was a girl that came around a a woman that came around and and we would have these long drawn out like 
kind of like pray over sessions and rebuking mm-hmm. the devil and trying, you know, all this stuff. And she would cough and spit and sputter and spew. And then we'd, we'd think that something had happened and then we'd mm-hmm. go on and then we'd be right back to the beginning. And I called, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just a kid. I'm in my twenties. Yeah. I'm just trying to be faithful and I, it's right in front of me and I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do with it. And because we, I, I, I came off the streets. And so that's where I went when I was converted as I was talking to homeless people and drug addicts. It's the only people I thought would ever listen to me anyhow. So that's where I went. And so mm-hmm. there they are. And, and so this woman, she seems sincere sometimes, and then she's going nuts other times and she's spewing and she's mm-hmm. all this stuff. And I just, at a cert, I called all the preachers I knew and I could get a phone number for, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this stuff? And I heard every different solution under the sun and she's got to want to close the doors and you blah, 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 and all this stuff. And I got to a certain point and I th- think it was God's intention in it for me. I was just like, I'm not doing this. I'm just spinning my wheels. I, I, I don't, ha- I don't have anything that I can make happen here. Like mm-hmm. I can't wish or will or or pretend my way into into something different than what is i just have to step back and say i don't have answers to this the next time that that so i i i took that from that situation and said what i what i told god is i said i'm not dealing with this if you don't tell me if you're not leading me and showing me what to do i just have to pass on this stuff it's out of my league the next time that I was confronted with a person um, who was in that that same category was at one of our meetings. He walked in and was under the influence, I think, both of, of supernatural things and, and mm-hmm. intoxicants. And we were having some gospel meetings and he was carrying on and and stuff and i walked in the back and i just put my arm around him and it was somebody i knew in my neighborhood Mm -hmm. and i i sat him down i I said here come over here and sit with me and i just sat there and prayed Mm -hmm. at a certain point in praying uh, i felt the spirit of the god of the lord say cast it out and i leaned over and whispered in his ear in the name of jesus come out and it was like the lights came on like he sat bolt upright was in his right mind and was sober like he Uh, did like he just woke up there Wow. And I, I said, listen, I feel like God's trying to speak to you here. You need to listen and you need to be very careful about what you do from here because God's trying to reach out to you. And he listened and he was convicted and he began to, to, to wrestle and have turmoil. And he started to say, I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't want to, I can't let go of it. I can't let go of it. And then he was gone. And then he went back into his the state and 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 some of the younger men in the church wanted to have an all night prayer meeting with him. And I was like, mm, I'm not going to do that. I, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think I've been involved to the capacity I was supposed to. I'm not going to mm-hmm. wrestle with things that are out of my domain. That's been my general take on spiritual things is that I think that I don't think that God wants us walking in ignorance in those things. They're too thorny and too, um, they're too complex. I think that if we have, if we have an openness to hear from God and to follow him, if he wants us working in those things, he'll show us what I don't accept is, is these like these legal fictions it's always been a bother to me it was a bother to me even in gospel and doctrinal issues when i was a child like god can't forgive if he doesn't if he doesn't deal with his justice and i'm like where does it say that who who's making this rule like who's above god that has a rule that says god can't forgive unless his justice is satisfied i don't know where it says that i've never seen nothing about that I just figure he's God. If he wants to forgive, yeah. he can forgive. Like, why can't, what says that's not, well, there's this whole like, you know, legal drama where the devil accuses you in court and Jesus is your, like all that stuff. I'm just like, what yep. are you guys talking about? I don't know nothing about that. I don't, I don't have any way to ground that in the real, in what I know. I don't have any way to ground it in what God's telling me. I, I get that you say it like, it makes sense. I get the analogy, mm-hmm but I don't see where any of that's necessary. And it's the same thing with a lot of these like legal transactional, like place to the devil kind of stuff. 
I just don't see it. I, you know, even when in the most explicit passages in the Old Testament where it talks about blessings and cursings, multi generational, this stuff, uh, the answer is not complicated. My, my life is is okay. Look at my wife and my life. My 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 great grandfather was a Pentecostal lay preacher in an Italian church. My grandfather was a Baptist preacher. My father was a deacon and a church worker my whole life. I'm an inheritor of all kinds of opportunity from growing up in a multi-generational Christian home. And for all of my controversy with my own people about some of those things and the doctrinal perspectives, I had access to the scriptures in ways that most people in the world, not just in America, but most people in the world have never had access to. And it's been meaningful to me from the time I was born to today in, in multitudes of ways that I could never even articulate. My wife is from a long line of outlaws and cattle rustlers and thieves and criminals and hard men in in the west mm -hmm. and and alcohol and addiction run in her family like preachers run in mine and and here we are mm -hmm. now how how do we end up at the same place the answer to the curses like what god's saying in the generational blessings and generational curses is not a legal transaction mm -hmm. it's a principle of reality if you do things the way that god designed for things to work they work well if you don't do things the way god designed them to work they don't work well and both of those patterns reverberate throughout lives throughout mm -hmm. relationships throughout character throughout mm -hmm. like if you're a drunk you're going to have your children are going to have problems that you're they're not going to have if you're not a drunk. If you're um, if you have a stable, healthy marriage, your children are going to have access and opportunity that they're not going to have if you don't have that. That's what the generate the cursings and blessings are descriptions of reality. They're not legal frameworks. And so if you want to change the tide, if you want to move the category, my life comes from a life of curse. I want to be in a life of God's blessing. You don't have to repent of daddy's sin or granddaddy's sin or any of those problems behind you. You just have to choose to obey. When you choose to obey, you move yourself out of the category of curse and into the category of blessing. That's all. That's all. And that's, that's the intention of why God's mm -hmm. saying that in the yeah. first place. He's trying to tell us, obey me and your life will produce blessing. Disobey me and your life yeah. will produce cursing. That's it. Yeah. It's not anything more than that. And so there's... Uh, I, I, I'm, I have a sympathy to some kinds of mysticism mm -hmm. and, and like I said, I'm charismatic. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can, I can go a ways into the unknown with people and be like, yeah, man, that's cool. I'm down for it. God mm -hmm. speak to me. I'm all about that. But I, I gotta, I gotta end at a place where my feet are standing on the ground and, and where yeah. the world makes sense. And, and I, my interactions in things that are outside of my capacities to understand and to see, I have to be holding God's hand through. That's how I navigate yeah. those things. Yeah. So when I meet people that are acting crazy or being crazy, are they crazy? Are they possessed? I don't know, unless I know, unless I feel like God's working with me in that environment and wants me to do something about it. Yeah. I'm just going to take my general perspective of caring for people and feeding them and warming them and, and trying to make them as whole as I can. And when God wants me to do something else, then he'll show me what to do. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I, uh, it, it, but part, part of the reason I'm interested in this is number one is personal. Like it's, it's a personal thing I'm wrestling through trying to figure out, but it, well, it you also, live in Philly. You probably come across it now and again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, and in LA as well with the, right. With the, I mean, you have a whole, you have a, what, one thing that I, I that I've always found interesting, I remember wa walking through. Oh gracious, was it Santa Rosa? Some like, f like back in the '60s would have been like a hippie, hippie, right. hippie hub, and just just seeing all of the, I mean, the hippies were incredibly spiritual as well as, right, drug, right. drug laden, and just just walking through and seeing like that age of people. Like obviously, a lot of hippies made it out. And, right. and we're fine. But then seeing the people that didn't and were still caught up, you know, laying on the park benches and just basically look like they were sitting there ever since the 60s. Right. And, and just seeing. But anyways, that's, that's a bit of a tangent. But um, but I also feel like it has 
like it ends up people like a misunderstanding of the spiritual realm or what I would consider a misunderstanding ends up having playing into our politics as well, which is where I, I think it comes into the third way. Um, because people end up really trying to spiritualize it and make it all about dark and light and right. Um, and there is dark and light. Um, but it's like a, we become so focused on, on demons and on not, not, you know, giving in to demons and, you know, demons are controlling the Democrats. And, and, right. and so then we end up, what I, what I think we end up sleeping with the demons of the Republicans in order to avoid the demons of the Democrats, you know? Right. Um, well, the other, the other way it catches people is with things and tokens. Like, yeah. I, I, I think that it happens in, in a couple respects. One of them is, the concept of worldliness. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a horribly abused and horribly misunderstood concept as well. What, what, what I, what I think God is warning us about in worldliness, it's the things that make us the enemy of God. And, and, mm -hmm. and because friendship of the world is enmity with God. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean if you wear this item or drive this car or listen to this music, God hates you. What it means is that there's 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 things there's systems that sustain the world as it is. Mm -hmm. Greed is something that sustains the world as it is. Hatred is something that sustains the world as it is. Mm -hmm. Power and ego are things that sustain the world as they are. Consumerism is something that sustains the world as it is. Like there there are there are institutions that come from that come out of the appetites of man that caused the world to be broken the way that it is broken. And those things are worldly. They're what sustains the world's order. It, what, it's what keeps mm -hmm. the world broken and from being what God intended it to be. And wherever we're touching or walking in one of those things, we're walking in worldliness. We're walking in opposition to what God wants the world to be. We're, 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 counter creational or anti-human or anti-christ all those things are similar constructs and where we're where our lives touch and run in those veins when we're pursuing greed when we're pursuing self when we're pursuing anger or unforgiveness or malice or or whatever breaking the world that's a place where we're we're walking in contradiction to god and it's and it has to be remove it's not that it's not that those institutions don't touch physical things they do but it's not about the physical thing it's not the it's not it's not the thing sitting on your shelf or the or the or the food that you consume that's what paul's dealing with with these you know these pagan customs versus christian conscience like He's trying to teach us. It's not about these things. It's about what's behind them. It's about understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where I get as close mm -hmm. as I, I tempt, uh, I endeavor to, to walk into understanding like mystical things about, about powers above the physical world is like trying to see where these systems touch our lives. Where are we walking in these ways of the world? What are the things that make the world mm -hmm. how it is? And so, so like when I look at, so I, I'm always looking to see what's past the physical to try to understand where this is coming from. Like what's causing us to lose grip of, 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 of gender identity? Like why, why is that? Like how do we, how do we frame that conversation where a person struggling with gender dysphoria or confusion about their identity isn't the problem, but there's something else that's causing that world to be so distorted. Where, what's the distortion coming from? And if you just mm -hmm. focus on the symptom, you're not, mm -hmm. we're not ever going to get anywhere with that. We're not, we don't know how to care for them. We don't know how to support them. We don't know how to lead them. We don't know how to present a different alternative. Like, uh, I, and I know that I was in that category for a long time. Like the first time I had somebody close to me who struggled with those issues, mm -hmm. I was, I, I, I just turned off. I was like, I guess he's no. gone. Like no. that's done. Like that's a hopeless situation. I'll never, I'll never have anything to do with that person again. They must be crazy. Like just dismissive and, and like, 
-hmm. when I look back, like cruel and miss so much opportunity. And now much later in my life, I have, I have people in my life that have those struggles. And I'm like, now I'm trying to understand and I want to, mm. because I care about the person mm -hmm. and I want to, I want to see, I want to, I want to sympathize. I want to know, I don't mm -hmm. want to just dismiss it as something, as something, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put it in like, a, I don't know how to say it right. I want, I, I want to care for the person and I want to, in, in order to do that, I have to try to understand what's happening in their world and so when i when i when i tried that approach here's what i here's what i saw at the other side i said oh okay because i have a friend who who has has gender problems gender gender dysphoria and and when they when they when they changed their gender identity their personality changed quite a bit uh and they became very gregarious and very open and very uh social Mm -hmm. and in a way that they weren't before and i was like that's it's a rebirth they 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 re they recast their identity they made a new person for themselves they didn't like who they were and what they were so they went through a process and became something new well there's a christian alternative to that now that i know what the goal is what the motivation is i know what the corresponding spiritual virtue to that is i know how to offer something that meets that need because it's not coming out of nowhere mm -hmm. people are not generally irrational they're mm -hmm. doing what they do for reasons there's motives there's, there's, there's goals, there's interests, there's all these things at the heart of why we all do what we do for better or worse. And if we can understand those motives, then we can address them. But if you just like ill, like gross, like, I don't like that. I don't understand it. I don't want to know anything about it. I'm just going to distance myself from it. That's worldly. Well, the worldly becomes the symptom instead of where, what yeah. the pursuit is. And that's a whole different framework. And I think that somewhere that that has to do with these bigger, like above the world kind of things. Yeah. So in kind of the, the frameworks that I would have circled in quite a bit, um, you know, the, the, the solvent or the answer to that issue to, you know, wh whether it's that specific issue of gender dysphoria or just struggles with belief or struggles with faith or, you know, even, even sickness and, and all that, those things, the answer would have been to identify the agreement that you had made yeah. with the enemy, with the devil, with a demon, um, with evil spirits. So something like reading the Lord of the Rings, which mm -hmm. is considered occult or reading Harry Potter, watching Harry mm -hmm. Potter, or having a dream catcher in on, on your wall. Right. Or, or, you know, listening to democratic political strategies right. or ideas or whatever those things would have been you know so agreements with evil that allow evil to wreak havoc in your life and thus there's this confusion there's this misunderstanding whatever all those things so the answer would have been to identify those things and then to renounce them and and cast them out and and anytime there's an issue you're you're navel gazing at yourself being like right my goodness what more do i have to cast out or, or it's all externalized it's all from out yeah. from with outside of me like mm -hmm. it's some exterior thing that's influencing me instead of something that's proceeding out of me and jesus is mm -hmm. teaching us that the things that are broken inside of us are coming from inside of us not from outside of us in like there's things mm -hmm. within the man that 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 need to be seen repented and 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 put right it's not yeah. the dream catcher it's yeah. not the it's not the exterior yeah. thing it's not because i would have the right, wrong thing or did the wrong thing or saw the wrong thing wrong thing it's manifesting whatever's coming out of me is coming from within me and i think that's a that's a central concept to what jesus is talking about about rectifying whatever's broken mm -hmm. within us mm -hmm. If indeed it's a brokenness, like some things are being passed off as brokenness that aren't brokenness, like, like being sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so a little bit along that, that line changing a little bit back to, to politics and government. Um, would you call the, 
the government of the United States satanic. I think Titus does for sure. And I'm, uh, uh, I want to. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm sympathetic with the notion because. So there's a controversy, you know, among among uh, patristic authors about whether or not Satan's offer of the kingdoms was a valid offer. I, mm, sure. I, Irenaeus doesn't think it was. He thinks Satan's a liar and he'd had no 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 right over mm-hmm. those things to offer them. I, I, I'm I'm inclined, uh, much to my dismay, to dis- disagree with him. I, I think that for those things to be real temptations, they had to be real potentials, um, and that 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 the devil is called the prince of the earth and the prince of power of the air for because he has real tangible domain and authority over men because what we see among the kingdoms of men is is these like god's ordaining of that potential notwithstanding we see all of these powers acting in ways that are that are the fruit of darkness that the the war the the oppression the 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 constant you know fighting to to be in power and control and exert authority over others instead of come under like all the fruit of what we see in the kingdoms of men in all of their aspects are 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 fruit of darkness like they 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 result in bad things um I I don't think that there's a simple answer to that question. I think that that there's an interplay between those two domains, between God's original purpose in in allowing those structures to be and in the devil's utilization of those for his own forces. Where I see that is like um one of the one of the prayers of the early church that that we try to repeat fairly often is is that God would quiet the the demonic spirits that stir up the strifes of men that cause war and fighting like that's a sincere prayer that we invoke from time to time especially when we hear of potential conflict and it's a prayer that the early church was engaged in to try to make for peace in the world and and i think there's some kind of striving between between god's authority and domain and the devil's desire to consume and destroy that that stirs up those strives. And I think that God wants us to collaborate with his intentions for the good of men and for peace. And, and that that's a real spiritual struggle that we can engage in. In fact, it's how it's how it's in part, how the church justifies their position within, within their culture and their, and their civil structure. They say, quit killing us. We're good for you because we pray for peace Mm -hmm. and, and God hears our prayers and he makes Mm -hmm. for a more peaceful world because we're here. We're here for your good. We make your Mm -hmm. world better, not just in our ministries for the poor. And we, Tertullian says, we care more for your poor than you do, but also in our spiritual pursuits to create peace on earth through our prayers and through our collaboration with God's spirit. So those are those are important things, and I so I, I can't answer a definitive. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of the fruit of of what what our country has and is doing is demonic. I think there's a lot of horrible. I I, I I'm interested in counter narratives. Uh, I'm 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 really interested, like in the in the uh, late 18th uh, century. Um, and early 19th dissenters, American dissenters to the Constitution are fascinating, like like Thoreau. You know, Thoreau was was uh, arrested for burning the Constitution in Boston Commons one time. Uh, he's a very interesting guy. And like a yeah. Lysander Spooner during the Civil War, uh, a fantastic anarchist writer. Um, there's men throughout throughout America's history that have 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 articulated really concise criticisms of the powers that be like Lysander Spooner's critique of, of the constitution. His, his, his short book is actually called the constitution of no authority. And, and what he says is why is everybody bound to a document that a few wealthy white men conscripted for the entire nation? Like nobody else agreed to this. 
the the black men in the country certainly didn't agree to it the women didn't agree to it all of us who were born after didn't agree to it why are we all bound to something that none of us signed on to like that kind of thinking and rationale like questioning the narrative the the general narrative it, it's a healthy thing to look at the contrary notion like what is the there's um I, li I watched a miniseries recently. I, I consider myself pretty uh, aware critic of American history and our involvement in the world. But I was even surprised. Uh, Oliver Stone did a miniseries on American history. I forget what it's called, but it's fascinating. I, it's six or seven, eight episodes where he does a real detailed analysis of, of American foreign involvement. Some things that I, I had that I was very aware of and others that I weren't like really nitty gritty details about uh, involvement in the first and second world war, even, even the dropping of the bombs. That's a, that's a controversial thing. Like I, I'm fascinated in like, we all just kind of whitewash the death of hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Like how, how does that happen? How do we just like, how do we just say, Oh, okay, well that that's a thing that happened. I guess we'll just all go on that, that we killed a hundred thousand innocent people. Uh, that's insane to me. And then you look into the historical narrative and you see all kinds of military, not conspiracy theorists, military top leaders that said, there's no reason that we need to do this. So what's the motive? Like that kind of, I, you, you know how I feel about conspiracies, especially right now. I'm, I'm yeah, very yeah. conspiracy gun shy, yeah. but there are, there are, that's where I see like this, these machinations, this collaboration between the worst parts of man and, and, and demonic enterprise like just it just it's it's just churning yeah. death yeah and destruction and violence and hatred and i so how how do we recast america's history through a lens of 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 a christian narrative what does it mean to if my enemy as an american has been whoever has been on the other side of us of a conflict what does it mean to look at those people with the lens of a Christian, what does it look sure. like to look at America's enemies as my brother yeah. and to, to sympathize with him and to see his side of a conflict. And that's a, that's a really telling yeah. exercise. Yeah. So, um, so yesterday was my birthday and happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And one of, one of the, I, I often say my love language is watching movies. Um, and so as a kind of, you know, a celebration, I, I live with my uh, brother and sister-in-law and their family um, here in Philly for now. And my, my dad and my sister who live in Lancaster drove in and we, um, they celebrated with me and, um, and we watched the post. They, they were like, we'll watch whatever movie you want. And so we watched the post, which I'm not sure how familiar you are with. Um, I, I don't know it. It's about, uh, it's two, a movie made in 2017 about the Washington Post and their releasing of the Pentagon Papers. Oh, I'm very familiar with the Pentagon Papers. Sure. I don't know that movie. And so it, it's about how the, um, just, I mean, it's it's very much like, like um, Trump era, you know, uncovering the misdeeds of the Nixon administration. Right. Um, so they, and you know, Hollywood is very happy to make a movie like that. Right. Um, but it, it's kind of going back about, you know, the New York Times released the first set or the first article right. or whatever in the Nixon administration. Basically, I, f I forget the legal terms for it, but to told them to to cease and desist. And um, and so the New York Times was appealing it, but they were listening. And then the Washington Post got the papers. And so the whole, the kind of the, the conflict is, is, are they going to risk imprisonment in order to you know, release the Pentagon papers? Anyways, so it's a, it's a compelling story. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's definitely a Trump era movie, I think. But um, it... Um, it was just it was just fascinating again i i really hadn't known I, i'd known surface knowledge of the pentagon papers but i i hadn't realized what all how impactful they were in revealing right. just huge. kind of the 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 evil this the, the right. satanic you know the the whole thing of um you know just how, how much knowledge the american government had 
in just the futility of the Vietnam War, and yet we we kept throwing. It's horrible. If you ever, in. if you're interested in 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 especially that time, yeah, Ken Burns's miniseries on Vietnam Ooh. is amazing. Ooh, I'm, I'm sure it's on Netflix. I should look it up. It's hard to watch. It hurts to watch. Yeah. It's such a there's so much death and so much pain and so much destruction for so little purpose. Yeah. Like that's what the that's that's the the smoking gun of the Pentagon Papers, right? Is David yeah. McNamara saying yeah. 70% of the reason we're still in Vietnam is because we're we refuse to lose a war. Yeah. Ugh. And it's and I I think I mean it it doesn't help when the government successfully hides those things from the people, but it I, th I think we we forget just just the magnitude of of a war like that you know even right. even the magnitude of the war that's that's going on right now you know in our lifetimes basically my entire life you know in in iraq and afghanistan and in, in just the far years, yeah, yeah the the i'm 25 you know i was i was six when that started you know yeah. um and just the far-reaching consequences it has to to even you know, the conversations we're having with Trump, you know, and, and, you know, you know, his, his supposed stance on war, war and the refugee crisis and all, all those things are kind of intertwined somewhat, you know, with, with, with the war, war started in the Bush era. Anyways, um, I, um, yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I mean, there's part of me that would, would, happily call the, the government of the United States satanic. But then I, I have friends who would really be like, you're satanic for saying that. <laughs> so here, everybody's satanic, I guess. Um, the, um, I think what I, what, what my, my like conclusion on that question would mm -hmm. be this. I, I believe that God's going to judge the nations. Mm -hmm. And when, and I don't want to stand on the America side of that judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And so whatever, whatever I have to do to demonstrate through my life that I'm not, I'm not, I don't properly belong in that category when God comes around to judging the nations that I distinguished myself as not American in some, mm -hmm. in, in important and meaningful ways mm -hmm. is, is, is ultimately my answer to whether or not this, this nation and empire is satanic. I, I don't want to stand with her in judgment. That's what I know. So that kind of ties into the nationalism thing and like our response as Christians, especially as like third way kingdom minded Christians, um, like what, what does it mean for nationalism to become idolatry? What do you do when, you know, you, even your Christian brothers and sisters around you are, are kind of buying into a, sen a sense of nationalism um, that we've seen, especially it feels like recently. Yeah. I, 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 I call them to repent. Like I, I think it's idolatry. I think it's a clear case of idolatry. Uh, I, I don't believe that Jesus permits a mixed allegiance. I think we're either, we're either we're either expressing our allegiance to him and his kingdom or to caesar that's 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 a very two kingdom narrative um and it's it's something that 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 i articulate in as many ways as often as i can that to align yourself like like he, here's the thing like whether you look backwards or forwards it's it we're we're going to the same place like we we originate in rebellion against mm -hmm. the authority that we are claiming to possess now like that's a bad that's a bad start like yeah. that's a hard yeah. thing to justify so so we start with our existence in rebellion against god's authority mm, that's a bad place to be well where are we going to be where are we going to end up like yeah. if america is around in the last day she's not on the jesus side of the equation yeah like the nations rise up against the church and if america continues to exist which is kind of an america um, americentric proposition to begin with I, th I think it's much more likely that we go the way of rome yeah. and and we just dissolve into some chaotic disorder and reemerge as some new a part of some new empire but if it were the case that that jesus was to come soon and in our lifetimes 
it will be America that opposes him and resists him and 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 rises up against his domain and power on the earth. That's that's like the end of the book. Like that's how it goes. Like you can't avoid that conclusion. So whether we look at our origin or our end, it's bad. There's nothing good to be had about it. So why are we putting ourselves in that category? Why are we why are we aligning ourselves with who is ultimately the enemy of Christ and his domain? I think this is where the anarchist writers and thinkers have a lot to offer the Christian community and why why I'm willing to take the kind of like hit to reputation because people hear anarchy and they think Right. They, they think hooded hoodlums breaking right. windows and streets. There's actually a really, a really authentic tradition, a thoughtful tradition for Christian anarchists. And what, what, what they're, what they're talking about is these domains of authority and who's really in power, where does power originate from and whose is it? And if it's Christ's, if he's the creator and if he's the king, and if his domain is over the whole earth and the whole creation, then then these other people are usurpers. They are temporary usurpers of his. Mm-hmm. And, and all of those things have to be subordinated below him. When he makes all of his enemies to submit to him, then he'll, he'll give all things that he himself submits to the Father and puts them back under him. Like these powers whether their utility notwithstanding are contests for the uh, for the authority that Jesus wants to have over people's lives and I, I i to put yourself on that side of of the authority spectrum is is it makes in a certain so back to our question are they satanic maybe i'll maybe i'll defer this way i'll say it's not satanic but it's antichrist sure yeah. It's antichrist in a real yeah. genuine sense yeah. in that it it's a contest for the authority of yeah. that Christ wants to have over every person's life and over the whole creation. So how how does how, like explain to me how, how nationalism is idolatry like like explain to me what um what is happening right in a person's mind or beliefs that makes it well, there's a call it idolatry. Yeah, there's 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 different there's different forms of that. One is to see the state of savior, and I think anytime we're replacing like mm. our capacity to manipulate the the social order to bring about like the ultimate good, we're we're substituting Jesus as savior for the state as savior. We're going to employ these mechanisms to to eradicate evil in the world or to bring about ultimate good or some utopian ideology and that that utopian political notion like politics is the expression of utopianism like people call me a utopian because i'm non-resistant and a kingdom person but the real utopian is anybody who's who's trying to enact political endeavors to make the world right like that's a utopian yeah that's someone who's trying to find a mechanism here currently existing to fix everything that's wrong and to mm-hmm. right all, 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 all the problems. Mm-hmm. That's an idealist utopian. But I, so there's this state as savior narrative. That's a huge problem. There's, there's the disobedience. Like we serve whoever we see as our master. And I think that's a, that's a primary definition of an idol is whoever you serve. And when we find ourselves serving these ideas of nation and state, it has all these other attendant consequences. People who are my brothers become my enemies, a la Germany in the World War or whoever else, whoever mm-hmm. potentially the Palestinian Christians are my enemies as an American, like all these these people who would be my brothers or could be my brothers now become my enemies because mm. I have, I'm serving the wrong, the wrong thing that, that notion of service, like worship to worship an idol. The, the terminology is, is like the old English word is obeisance to bow down before it's rooted in the Hebrew and Greek words for worship. Whoever you're bowing down to is who your master is and and putting someone else that you bow down to someone else that you become the servant of someone else that you become the the you're at their bidding to do their will like when that state mm. that's that's an idolatry mm. you're bowing at the wrong at the wrong place um, so 
Go the, ahead. Well, it's, it's just interesting the putting it in that terminology because, you know, doing your civil duty or doing a civil service is, is considered a really admirable, noble thing to do in America. So then like, I mean, yeah, like what, like, you know, doing your civil duty, you know, participating in jury duty, um, you know, uh, you know, it, a lot of good things too can be put under that title as well. But it was just an interesting yeah, connection I, th- I thought of as in, in we're literally, by doing our civil duty, we're putting ourselves as servants to- Right, right. Civil servants. servants. Yeah, civil servants. It's yeah. interesting. Should, um, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but should we fear- the erosion of religious freedom. And, and I feel like that's kind of leading the witness a little bit, but um, yeah. <laughs> the, um, and, and how should we respond to laws and politicians who, who feel like they're doing so? I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to treat that question frivolously, like, mm-hmm. because, because, because we come from a place of real privilege in regards mm-hmm. to that question. Mm-hmm. Um, what we know about our brothers and sisters who have not experienced that is that they, they, they thrive in ways that we don't. Um, I, I'm suspicious of my own or my brethren's motives in avoiding crosses, like to set up, to set up environments where we can make sure that we're never going to suffer does, does not seem in line with becoming a disciple of the, of the suffering lamb. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think that's the same as inviting pain. I don't think it's. A, there's a kind of anti-human um, ascetic that wants to, you know, f- flagellate the flesh, and and it's some kind of like religious devotion to punish the self. I, I don't think that's that's a Christian principle. I don't think we should invite pain and torment and and persecution, but I also don't think that I think that when we're actively trying to make sure that our environment can never hurt us, that's, that's not going to produce good Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, yeah. So, so I, I look at those attempts in that light, like, they they're you can effectively call them anti-cross legislation i i think that Mm -hmm. the church is designed to be a subculture i don't think it's supposed to be a dominant power narrative the -hmm. church is never there's nothing that's good come out of the world where the church is the dominant power narrative where the church does what she's supposed to do is when she's a subculture and, and subculture Christianity with, without Christians having access to the levers of power is when we have been at our best. And um, I don't, yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't imply that we have to be persecuted. It just means that we're not the one, the Pax Romana ends with the Christian yeah. Roman empire. Yeah. Like it's just, it, it's so evident that yeah. it is the lesson of history. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Did, do you feel like we've lost religious liberty? Like in your lifetime, no. this is an interesting thing. I, I like to ask older people. Not at all. Yeah. No, not, not in any, not in any way whatsoever. Yeah. And I live, I live among all the worst liberal environment in America. Yeah. I live on the, in liberal yeah. New England. Yeah. I, 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 now I will say this. I think that I think that it very well could come a time when confiscation of property and and punishment for our convictions regarding the Bible are not are not things that I cannot imagine. They're not sure. so far off or remote yeah. that I can't entertain the idea of them. They could happen. And I think that, you know, what some of the lessons from history is that confiscation of property and imprisonment are the first things that happen to to God's people when persecution comes. That's interesting. I, I, I'm not running from that. I want to be yeah. at the center of it when it happens, yeah. if it happens here. Uh, yeah. I think that it's likely to happen over sexual ethics, mm-hmm. it, at least as the world stands today, sure. like where we're most likely to find pushback, legal or otherwise, cultural or legal persecution is mm-hmm. is in regards to our sexual ethics. Mm-hmm. 
I, I don't know entirely why all that is. I, I think it's just a function of the age and the culture. But it's interesting to me. There's um there's a really neat book. What's his name? Eric. Um, I don't remember. Uh, in the Garden of Beasts. I think it's called in the Garden of Beasts. It's about um, the American ambassador in Berlin right before the war breaks out. And it's interesting to see how, how persecution begins. It's not usually state sanctioned. It's culturally sanctioned. Like there becomes a zeitgeist in the culture that, that, that um, squashes dissent. So it was, it was, the Sig Heil became the, the, the tool in Berlin for distinguishing who was in and who was out. And it wasn't officially sanctioned, although there was, there was covert persecution like secret prisons and kidnappings mm -hmm. and things that were happening through the SS and some of the early, um, the early Nazi institutions. But the real, the real problem, even for Americans who were traveling in Germany in those early pre-war years, uh, was when, like, uh, it, it happened often, and you hear about this a lot because it was happening through the, 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 the American ambassador's office was the one that was dealing with this. Americans would be in, in somewhere in Germany, and they would, there would be a parade that goes by, or some SS soldiers would come into a cafe or something, and everyone would sit high on them. The Americans wouldn't do it because they weren't Germans, but they yeah. can't tell, like, no, who knows. And so these people would get beaten up or chased out of areas or, you know, wow. whatever would happen to them. And that's, that's, I think how we'll start. If, if persecution comes to America, it'll be in those kinds of capacities. But what, what, what uh, I think that we should highlight is the opportunity in those times, like the opportunities mm -hmm. in that, in, in the times of Nazi Germany were to identify with the oppressed. Like I, I said uh, when when the Muslim travel ban happened, and maybe this is coming full circle on your protest question, mm -hmm. when the Muslim travel ban happened, and they talked, to, there was real talk. I don't know about in government centers, but in certainly in 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 political and cultural centers, there was talk of Muslim registrations. We should know mm -hmm. who these people are. I, I was telling my family and my friends, if there's a Muslim registry, I'm signing up. I, I want to be identified with the people who are being oppressed, not the people who are yeah. oppressing put my name on that list like i'll identify with the mm -hmm. oppressed class i'll put myself on on that not because i'm a muslim but because i identify with people who are under the thumb of the state mm -hmm. I, that's where i want to be mm -hmm. henry david thoreau said in a in a society which imprisons men unjustly the proper place for a just person is a prison like that's wow that's a that's how we ought to be thinking yeah. about these places is not avoiding whatever problems come but how do we again how do we get in the middle how do we get in the center yeah. how yeah. do we become the agent of 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 change it's the same thing when they were bombing palestine i'm like i you know those those i don't know how closely you watch those events but uh during one of the one of the big incursions early in the trump administration mm -hmm. no it was late in the obama administration there was four little boys playing soccer on a beach that were bombed mm -hmm. and and pictures of their do dead bodies showing up and i'm like how would that scenario be different if it was americans like what like that's what shane claiborne does when he goes to iraq right mm -hmm. he's like I, I if we're if america's gonna bomb iraqis then i want to be on the iraqi side not the american side like in that kind of thinking, I think that's what yeah, Reagan's yeah. been notable yeah, for. Yeah. And and some of the people that have gone into Iraq with Kingdom Channels and and some of the interests that people have had in I-58 and going to Greece and working with refugees is like, how does the church get on the persecuted side of the equation? Not because we're inviting pain or problems, but because we want to be known as the people who mm -hmm. care, as the people who are mm -hmm. on that side of the injustice equation. Mm -hmm. And all this talk about how do we how do we protect ourselves? How do we defend our religious liberties? It's just a wrong. It's a whole yeah. wrong yeah. ideology. Yeah, it's it's not even it doesn't look anything like what I know of of Jesus and his mission in the world. Yeah. So, so I mean, th this very, very much comes full circle and kind of comes to the the discussion I wanted to kind of wrap up on and kind of the crux of of what I'm what I'm trying to get after is if, 
if we, and I, I'm leaving a lot of questions on the table, just FYI, <laughs> maybe we'll have to do a part two, but um, if, if we are going to tell, you know, our neighbors, well, okay, maybe we're not telling our neighbors, but if we're going to suggest that Christians who are living under King Jesus um, and giving allegiance to King Jesus should not participate in politics, should not use those means and methods to bring justice, you know, and, and, and even to the point of, of suggesting that we shouldn't vote, um, then I, like, I really think, and, and I'm confident you agree, is that like, we should, we need to be on the front of pursuing justice by other right. means. And, right. and, and to, to the point that people, people know me and are like, well, Christopher doesn't vote, but, but man, he's doing this over here. And, and, and that's way more effective or he's, you know, in his immediate sphere, or whatever, he's being incredibly effective. Um, and, and so I can't, can't tell him he's rolling over cause he's not, he's right. putting, as you said, he's, he's putting himself in, in the center, in the middle. Right. Um, I think Reagan, Reagan has a great phrase for that. Um, how did, how did standing, standing, I think, how does he say it? Maybe standing in the way of evil or standing in the way of violence. Um, but basically just this idea of, um, he tells the story of, of Christians in Nazi Germany when they were going to cart off Jews in, in this one town, this village that, you know, you never hear really hear this story, but, um, and these Christians came out and said, if you're going to take them, you have to, you have to take us, you have to get through us. You have to put us on the, on the train and just, just that idea of, um, getting in the way, getting in the way of evil. Um, so, so yeah, like how, what's your, what's your answer to that? I know you've addressed it a little bit here and there, but like, when, well, when I it, think uh, what, what I would say is that anybody that like each of us should have passionate pursuits, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 we can't all do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I think that 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 our brothers and sisters should be involved in poverty relief. We should be involved in homelessness. If that's if that's your passion, if those are the people that you love, mm -hmm. get in the middle of it. I guarantee you that a life lived in service to to homeless people will do infinitely more than voting for legislation for how to deal with homelessness. Yeah. I, I know that's true. Yeah. And the same is true with abortion. If abortion is your issue, if you if you are incensed by the injustice of the of the murder of abortion as we should be what are you going to do like how cheap and paltry is it to vote over that right. like you're gonna you're gonna cast a one in 300 millionth expression of an interest about what yeah. that what the outcome of that should be yeah. or actually get involved with the yeah. causes for why people yeah. have abortions yeah. hey, I, so he, here's the thing over in Af over in Uganda, our, our our one of our biggest ministries is his, his Image Ministries. The church in Kampala runs it. A abortion is illegal in Uganda because Uganda is a Christian state, right? Mm -hmm. Abortion is illegal; can't do it. It's also very very common. Uh, our community is situated right under the shadow of of one of the biggest universities in Africa, Makerere University. There's tons of students and there's a situation, there's a cycle that happens where because of, in part because of colonialism and Western interests, we have sold a bill of goods mm -hmm. to, to the African community that the answer to all of your poverty problems are education. If you just get a degree, you'll, you'll be okay. And so hold on one second. No problem. What, is it? what do you, what do you need Cephas? my pen and my thermos hey can you come say hi this is mr whitmer hey hi. cephas cephas hey buddy good Thanks to see you me my pen and my thermos will you shut my door yeah. it's okay there it is thank you so the cycle, the cycle is this. Mm -hmm. We'll scrimp and save and do everything we can to put the firstborn through college education. Now, there's tons of 
college educated people in Kampala that are out of work and in poverty, but, but it's the narrative. It's Mm -hmm. what everybody's kind of like selling into buying into. And, and so, so all of the family's like leveraged position is on this child getting a degree. And, and if, if sometimes that's the oldest girl in the home and there's still this kind of like Western expectation of sowing your oats in college and, you know, having romantic flings and partying and all this stuff. So girls get pregnant. Now, now the leverage decision is either have an abortion, an illegal abortion, a common illegal abortion, Mm -hmm. which is readily available on campus. There's actually a clinic on campus that does abortions, but they're technically illegal or, or, or offend your whole family and all their sensibilities and all of their resources that they invested in you. That's a really leveraged decision. Wow. What, what good is the legislation doing? It's not stopping anything. I mean, Maybe some, I'm not going to say it's useless and I'm not going to say that the state doesn't have a right to say it. It's a, it's a legitimate thing for the state to say, don't, don't commit infanticide. I'm, I'm on board with that. That's a legitimate thing for the state to say, but it doesn't work. It's not doing what's doing. The work is for our people there one person at a time to make connections with people who are in that difficult position Mm -hmm. and go through the hard work of helping them figure out a different situation, either Mm -hmm. loving them if they go through that decision and, and deal with the counseling and the ramifications afterwards, or try to get involved with them, with the, with the father of the child, with Mm -hmm. their, to take them, these women back to their villages and explain the hard news to their parents and talk through those difficult conversations and try to help them figure out the difficulty and isolation of being alone and ostracized because of that decision, help them get their medical care taken care of, and then figure out what their life is going to be like without a college education and now being a, oftentimes a single mother with a child. That's really hard work. If Mm -hmm. you care about abortion, do that hard work. The, the vote, one of 300 million people saying don't do it is worth so little. Yeah. And the work of actually involving yourself yeah. in one woman's life who's in that situation yeah. is immeasurably yeah. more. Like, and this is the case with all of these situations, whether it's homelessness, whether it's addiction, whether it's abortion, whether it's a Christian business, I, I don't care yeah. what, like whatever you want to be passionate about, you can use that as a mechanism for justice in yeah. the kingdom. Just go out and be involved and engage yeah. and tell people who are wasting their time, money, energy, and attention in the in political utopianism, forget that. Actually do yeah. something that that yeah. means something with your life. Yeah. Well, and and especially when we consider how much like time and energy and money has been poured into just the voting aspect of it and and, and lobbying and pulling and you into the fray of all yeah. the like and and the barriers that you build forth, right in in the debate and discussion should it be illegal should it not be right. illegal and and rather than actually like because I, I don't think anybody is going to resent you as a right. christian for trying to to find actual real solutions for either single mothers my, or my or friends prevention. Who- Right. My friends who believe in abortion, who are pro pro choice, I explain Mm -hmm. the situation of women in Africa. And I'm like, look at these, what these women are going for through, like, that's a horrible place for them to have to be, to have to choose Mm -hmm. to have an abortion or, and, or lose their family and, and all this stuff. Even if you're pro choice, that's a bad situation. Like there's sympathy to be found and how much better to try to leverage that argument and make a real point that causes people to think than to put it in those terms where it's not this caustic, I'm, I'm going to overrule your will, or you're going to overrule mine. And we're in this contest of the death of who's going to win. But like, how about real compassion about real people in the situation? And it also allows me to really engage with the difficult situations that cause to a, that lead people to make a conclusion different than mine. I don't like it. I think it's horrible. It's, it's, it's death. But there are real reasons that people make those decisions. And if I just pretend like everybody who doesn't agree with me is a monster who's, who's, you know, a demon crat, whatever the case, you know, however you want to dismiss yeah. people who are different than you, yeah. you don't really, you you have no hope. You're never going to change any, you're never going to convert what you think is evil into good with those mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. So, I mean, basically if if you want to do justice um put yourself in involved involved 
get find find the mess <laughs> and and be a part of the solution be a part of the i really like, like go ahead go, yeah there's another like that there's a there's another case to be made for what the world what the church is in the world and one of my very favorite expressions from the early church is that uh a brother said the church is to the world what the body what the soul is to the body Hmm. I think what he means by soul is something more like our word conscience. And that's a really beautiful analogy to me. It, it's so meaningful in so many different ways, because like my conscience, your conscience are things that have no force of will. You can't, it can't make me do anything. My conscience has never moved a muscle in my body. It also is something that I can't shut up. Like it doesn't go away. It's insistent. It's persistent. It's, it's unequivocating. It doesn't move. You can't, it's very hard to get rid of. And, and it has no force, no, no power to make me do anything, but it's, it's incredibly dynamically powerful. It's like the, the universal human conscience. That's what, so the church ought to be fulfilling that kind of function in the world in which she's situated. She ought to be the voice of moral reason, either accusing or excusing her society and culture at large. And, and to that end, I, I, I think that it's, it, it's sometimes appropriate to exercise public demonstrations of that moral voice. So this this becomes a gray area where where do, where do you stop and start this mm -hmm. this kind of thing and i recognize the all the grayness of that of that premise but sometimes like like in the most recent example i i was involved in a lot of anti-war protests in the early days of the iraq invasion um that's probably the 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 most public political activism i've done is in regards to anti-war uh protests uh, and and abortion. I've also been involved in abortion protests, and it's been in, it's been in the interest of expressing the church's conscience to the world around me. Um, it's complicated quite a bit in our country because of this uh, Christian ethos narrative, the Judeo Christian sense of self that that America and the West has, especially America. America is much more religious than the rest of western world mm -hmm. as religious americans yeah, even our irreligious irreligious people are religious as religious americans the ideas that get mixed into into right and wrong they mm -hmm. always take on this flavor of religion and mm -hmm. and and that makes this scenario particularly complex because it's not just america expressing her interests it's often america expressing her christian interests like like the Iraq war like that was that was a place where I was particularly involved in public demonstration is because uh, on on the Christian evangelical side of 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 the spectrum the the war was very much pitched from the White House all the way down to the church house as the neo crusade as east versus west christian versus muslim right versus wrong good versus bad and that narrative was blasphemous and and as such i felt particularly compelled to speak as publicly as i could about the blasphemy of that narrative mm -hmm. i don't know that every issue means the same thing and i don't even know how effective it is although i will say that that i think that the end of the vietnam war does happen because of public dissent and and that that accumulation of dissent does have a rippling effect throughout the culture and it, it could be it could be that the current state of abortion legislation is due in part to that same thing there there is increasingly more regulation against abortion across america throughout the last few years abortion is becoming more and more difficult in many parts of the country probably because of the same kind of public dissent mm -hmm. so but it's not measurable, right? It's it's something that is mm -hmm. kind of in the air. And I, I don't know that everybody needs to. I don't know that everybody feels called to. But I think it's legitimate to, to voice Christian dissent in public. Mm -hmm. And we can stop short of being coercive and have that kind of like conscience effect in the world. 
But if 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 that's what it is, then we're no better than voters. If like so so the last time I was involved in something of that nature was during the during the immigration block, uh, the 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 Muslim ban, what we came called the Muslim ban, and and my public expression in that regard wasn't intended. And I, who cares what my intentions are? You know, we're showing up with signs that say Jesus says love the stranger and the pilgrim love the sojourner um god's people welcome all people like those kinds of statements were we made in public situations because for the same reason because i felt like the church was on the wrong what was known as the church in america was on the very wrong side of that issue and the narrative had to be corrected it should mm-hmm. have been corrected mm-hmm. and one way that we could do that was making those public statements in the name of being christians not only that, but that I wanted to be known as people who were not afraid of immigrants because we do a lot of our work with immigrants. Like yeah. the last thing on earth I want is mm-hmm. for immigrants in my community to think that Christian people don't want them here and yeah. don't care for them and don't want to be involved in their life and don't want to support and help them. That would be a horrible loss to my mm-hmm. community mm-hmm. for the immigrant community not to know that we were we, we didn't have any fear of them. So those kinds of that there's a way to collaborate these interests of public mm-hmm. and private expressions w- without crossing the line of 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 co-opting force and coercion mm-hmm. in order to get those points across. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's um, like I, I think the thing the thing that is most difficult for me to know right now is like num- number one you know what like I-, I agree with your with your whole thing of like i don't think we need to be focused on every single issue of our day um just just from a practical point of view like you'll you'll be a mile wide and inch deep but right um so you know there's there's part of me that's like figuring out okay what is that for me um, right. but then also too, like it, it's a new community. I'm, I'm in Philadelphia. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Um, I'm much more aware of the needs in LA. I think, um, I tend to gravitate towards like issues of poverty, I think. Um, so, so just like figuring those things out here in Philly is, is kind of a journey in figuring out who's, who's participating. Cause like the last thing I want to do is come in with my savior mentality and be like, right. here, I'm here to bring justice something new right Right. and and what i really want to do is just you know join whatever's already going on and and help to bring um but then also like trying to figure out like what does what does it mean to do justice in like kind of the among the racial conversations of of our times and when you know when it comes to george floyd and when it comes to um the police brutality and, and those those types of issues and conversations um what is you know if, if if our solution is not voting um you know how do we how do yeah how do we how do we seek justice from a from a jesus perspective for for that issue well did you see the white moms in portland in the george floyd protests uh uh-uh. there was in in the i think it was portland uh portland oregon uh there's there's some really amazing pictures of the flood protest with the police on one side and the african-american community on the other and a row of white middle-aged women in between locked arms like if you're going to if you're going to perpetrate violence in this community you have to go through us like those I think those are valid yeah. means of, of involving ourselves in those situations. I think that being in the middle of those conflicts and having something to say and something to offer um, changes the scope of that, of that whole yeah. narrative. I, I think, you know, that, that the, the issues of race as it pertains to America are by and large issues of law enforcement and, and issues of imprisonment and, like those are issues that there's plenty of room for the church to be involved um whether that you know in in every facet of that whether it's you know dealing with 
drugs, dealing with employment, dealing with mm. post prison employment. Like there's all kinds of opportunities for the church to be involved in the issues that are affecting the community, the minority communities all across America, because like, so if you care, then you start to look right. Like if you care about, if that's an issue that that's important to you, that's, that's around you and that involves people that you care about, well, then you want to understand it. Like, why is it so? Why, why is it the way it is? And, and you have to know some, you have to have some notion of why it is the way it is to know what to do about it. But, but again, let me just, let me just restate how futile the political ambitions are in regards to that. Now we have a DA vice president and that's the one that was supposed to fix the problems with the law enforcement against the African-American community. Like that's so absurd. It's laughable. Like the person who is the problem got elected to fix the problem. Like our discontent with racial (laughs) policies caused us to pick the way lady who enacted all those policies to the second highest office in the land. That's how, that's how, that's how futile the hope in that system is. Yeah. So what isn't futile? What isn't futile is how how do I get involved in that issue? What, what's meaningful? How do I get involved in people who are, who are afflicted by those, by those issues? How do I get involved? How do we, how do we create work for people coming out of prison? How do we, um, how do we work with young people to provide alternative solutions? How do we get involved in the culture where there's meaningful ways that, that, that don't end in, in the same kind of problems? Like there's all kinds of ways to begin addressing those issues. How do we have multi-ethnic churches? Like, Hey, that'd yeah, be a great yeah. solution. Like, <laughs> let's figure out how to get our churches. Not so white. <laughs> right. Uh, what are we doing? That's causing us to be in that category. Like yeah. that's a huge racial disparity yeah. issue. Our churches ought to match the demogra- the, the ethnic demographics of the places where that church is. If we have all white churches and not all white communities, then there's something wrong with our churches. The church is supposed to be nativized. It should be roughly equivalent to the people that live around that church. So, <coughs> so there again, you know, in a quick, in a quick survey, you can see the futility of how the world's trying to find solutions to that and all the potential that there would be to actually engage yourself in the issue and find real solutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we are um, heading into the fourth hour, I think. Um, this is good stuff. I, uh, yeah, it's it's. Um, I'm I'm not hard to convince. <laughs> <laughs> I a uh, little bit of choir preaching. Yeah. Well, yeah. I um. I could. I could. I can very easily like see somebody's perspective and be like, Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, I definitely lean, lean this way to begin with. So it's, it's not, um, I, I, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of hangups and devil advocates going on inside my brain often and, right. and I'm trying to figure out like, okay, but what about this angle? And then, and then, you know, I'll post something on Facebook and, and one of my reformed friends or just my mainstream evangelical friends those aren't always the same um right. will will give what about this position or what about this and i don't quite have an answer for it and so um but yeah it's 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 good stuff it, it um i definitely really appreciate the like kind of the practical thought like i'd even just you your illustration with your daughters and how just that, like that, that's a, if you don't live in the city, you might not see it, but like, I mean, I've, I've lived in the city most of my life for sure. All my adult life, like those opportunities happen. Like I can, I can do that. Like I can go out and, and, and start doing that. You know, when I, when I see it, um, everything, everything in us doesn't do that naturally. It's not a, it's not a natural impulse. Like we're, we're risk averse and we don't mm-hmm. want to get involved. And I think it's a mm-hmm. Christian discipline yeah. to have eyes for that and ears for that and say, I'm not going to follow my natural impulse. I'm not going to walk away. I'm not going to. And, and, and there's these little practices I think that can help cultivate that attitude. Like for, so for first we have to be in places where people are. Yeah. I, yeah. 
I'm, uh, I'm not going to reiterate my pitch for urban Christian communities, yeah. but, but know that there is one. Yeah. <laughs> we have to be where people are. Yeah. If we want to engage ourselves in meaningful things with people. But secondly, like there's little practices that, that, that I've, I've tried to incorporate into my life. Okay. It seems like a dumb thing when you're in a store and, and somebody has a name tag on, call them by their name. Yeah. Like, it's it's not about their name it's not about that experience although all those things are kind of can be kind of fun but it's about learning to see yeah. people for people yeah. you're not you're not a machinery of this corporation you're yeah. not personnel you're yeah. a person you're somebody yeah. with a name yeah. and a mother and a father yeah. and children you're somebody you're not the the lady putting my bag my groceries in a bag you're rosa you're, you know, that kind yeah. of like, how do we, I feel like that's, a, that's worldliness is to buy into the dehumanization of my fellow man. And there's a million yeah. different ways that the world's trying to dehumanize yeah. my neighbors. And, and I want to figure out ways to humanize my people, the people yeah. around me. Yeah. And like names are a huge way to do that. Like that's a dumb little thing that you can do to humanize the people in your world because, and it's like right there in front of you. Yep. Like if you don't, if I don't think about that, I would never know to do it. Yeah. But, but an interest in, in having real human contacts causes me to say, Oh, there's their name. I'm just going to call them by their name. I'm yep. not going to say, Hey guy, or thanks. I, hey, Joe, I appreciate you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. That kind of stuff. It does. There's an, there's a, an accumulation of those kinds of effects. Another one is, is to, to look panhandlers in the eye. Yeah. And I, I know that you know about this one, like interactions with panhandlers and with people in, in, in poverty, there's a natural impulse when you pull up to the stoplight to look away from the guy holding the sign. Mm -hmm. It's where your eyes go. There's a, it's like a it's like a knee jerk reaction to look away mm -hmm. look in the eyes like because you have to recognize the humanity and the indignity of a person in that place like to look into the eyes of someone who says i'm desperate enough that i'm just asking you for money i don't know what else mm -hmm. to do maybe he knows what to do maybe it doesn't but the fact is he's in that place mm -hmm. and to humanize him in that place instead of try to dismiss him instead of trying to turn him into a lamp post yeah. or an animal or yeah. a tree to say that's a human mm -hmm. who has a need it mm -hmm. is expressing a need like maybe i have cash in my pocket maybe i don't but either way i want to look and it's hard to look it's hard to look but the but the bible says that god despises those that turn their eyes from the poor like what he's saying yeah. is look at it even mm -hmm. if you can't do anything mm -hmm. look because if you mm -hmm. look you have to humanize and if you humanize you have to care like there's little things that to me are infinitely more value than i could ever do through america's political process yeah. they are creating humanity in me and in the people around me and those are the places where we should be we should be tweaking all those little places where we can find humanity around us where we can find not let me rephrase that where we can find god in the people around us because man is the image of god and i'm not it's not just the human that i'm looking for it's what god has made mm -hmm. in my fellow man that i'm looking for in those interactions mm -hmm. wow wow yeah that's that's powerful and i think that's a that's a great note to end on um, and that's, yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what I want to see. That's what kind of, kind of reinvigorated my love for, for, I don't, I don't know, love for Jesus or, 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 it, you know, the kingdom, his way being a part of his kingdom. Or the quest um, for logos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thanks for your time. I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate an open ear and good questions appreciate, and i appreciate that. appreciate you coming on and and giving me what is this three and a half hours of of your night um quick quickly do you have any um like books resources that in your journey um i'm sure you could talk for a long time about stuff but just if people are interested in reading up on on kingdom 
kingdom yeah. focused theology on nonviolence on non-political whatever yeah i um i i th- i think that there i have a kind of uh, a top top few list uh, anatomy of a hybrid by leonard verdwin is one for understanding power structures um i think that um it's not in the topic of our conversation, but but something that's really important to me is what Jesus is doing on the cross and Gustav Allen and Christus Victor, Gustav Allen's book, Christus Victor, uh, in explaining what Jesus is doing as an emblem and an example in his life teaching ministry, death and resurrection, I think is a super important part of my own journey in, in discovering Christ's purpose on the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, the politics of Jesus you know, it has that caveat that it comes from John Howard Yoder and, and there's all the liabilities that come with him, but, but politics of Jesus has some of the best expressions about understanding what Jesus is doing as a political action in his living ministry. Um, Faith and Wealth by Justo Gonzalez is a fantastic book. It goes through, it's, I wouldn't say it's academic, but it's not light reading either. Um, it goes through Justo Gonzalez is is well known for his Christian history, two volumes of Christian history. But this book is is much smaller. It's called Faith and Wealth. I think the subtitle is something like the origin, significance, and use of of money in the early church. Uh, and what it dis, what it what it goes through is like the what would pass for economic theory that the church is born into. Jesus is teaching the apostolic teachings and the post apostolic teachings regarding the church and wealth and how that migrates over time and like changes and then swings back to an original view sometime among the Cappadocian, the three Cappadocians. Anyhow, it's a fascinating look and survey at Christian teaching, early Christian teaching about wealth and money and, and what our relation to those things should be. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. Just yeah. those books. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, interested. that's good stuff. I definitely going to be putting on them on my list. I'm sure there's a lot of people who could benefit. And, and, and I, I'd be remiss not to mention, uh, Finney Caravella's King oh, Jesus yeah. claims his church. That's a good practical analysis of what, what the church should be doing and how to be looking at the scriptures yeah. with a healthy hermeneutic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much, Matthew, um, for coming on here and taking the time and talking it, talking it through for me. Um, Glad to. I really appreciate it, and I can't wait. I'm really excited to get this out to to my friends and to people who follow the Third Way and follow me. So yeah, it's great. If we ever have a chance to do it I'm, again, I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I got a list. I got I got to continue the list. So <laughs> all right, all right. Well, hey. peace, brother. Thanks yep. for your time. Yep. For sure. Thank you. you That was my conversation with Matthew Milioni, one of the church planners with Followers of the Way in Boston. If you want to keep up with Matthew, he's on Facebook. Um, I'm not sure if he has any blogs or not, but he also helps with the Dank Kingdom podcast, where you can subscribe wherever podcasts are found, as well as he is an administrator of the Dank Kingdom meme group. Dink Kingdom Meme Farm is the group is the name of the group. You can apply to become a part of the group if if you're interested in these types of conversations. They also have a public page if you're more interested in just observing the content. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for listening, and we will see you next episode. I see my
see my 